Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome at a new episode of the Isa podcast. My name is Brahim Karak. I'm one of your hosts today, together with Sinan. Yes, my name is Sinan Kula. Um, I'm 22 years old. I'm a board member at SVA Day and I study political science at the University of Leiden. Yes. And our guest for today is uh, none other than uh, Mohammed Hijab. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Salam. Salam. How are you doing? Not bad. Yeah. Good to be here. Good to be here. Good to have you. No, thank you very much. Thank you. You're Mohammed Hijab, you're a debater and public speaker. Um, you completed a politics degree and a master's in history from Queen Mary Un University. And you have uh, numerous ijazas in some Islamic sciences and has studied in multiple Islamic semin seminaries, including uh, Shinkiti yeah. Institute. <laughs> now, now you're just reading out my profile, isn't it? Definitely. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and you're doing further postgraduate research in Islamic studies mm -hmm. at SOAS, University of London. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a little bit about yourself. Probably most people will know you from your debates on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, Speaker's Corner. And um, I saw that you recently uh, did a podcast that uh, rerouted with Musa yeah, Adnan. Yeah. And you spoke about um, your personal journey. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm interested in, you're doing a lot of debates on YouTube mm -hmm. um, and now also more public debates, like for example, with David Wood. Mm -hmm. When did the whole debating thing started? Um, it's a good question. I think um, in terms of formal debates, I, I think the first ever debate or public kind of formal debate I did was in school, actually, when I was in uh, uh, sixth form. Okay. And I think that, there was, that I started to realize that I had an ability to speak and communicate quite well um, when I was about 16 years old, 15, 16. And um, I'll tell you where I think it actually stemmed. I think it actually stemmed from discussions we used to have in English when we used to do English uh, language in school. And I realized that when we had those discussions, I was able to kind of steer, steer the discussions in the most, you know... Favorable uh, way yeah, for you. Like, yeah, like, and so on. And so it's, I think it's developed at a quite a young age, actually, to be honest. And then um, when I was about 16 or 17, I started doing it. We had this, we had like school um, elections. You know, uh, we had a quite a big school as well. Yeah, this was primary school. No, this is secondary school. Secondary so I was sixteen school, okay. and seventeen years yeah. old. So um, this is sixth form, and um, we had these elections, and we all had to kind of prepare like something. And you know, it's funny, it's ironic enough, but it was like mock um, elections because I was doing an A level in politics at the time, and it was part of that. What does that mean? A level. An A level is basically. Um, it's something you have to complete before going into university. Okay. So in the UK system, you have three A-levels, usually or four, that you do before you go into university. Mm -hmm. So it's part of my A-level in politics to um, to do this thing where you ha you literally have to go to each year group and you have to present and debate with the other campaign. campaign yes, vote on Mohammed Hijab. And, and funny enough, do you know who? Um, and we were all representing political parties. Okay. Um, and I had to represent the Liberal Party, okay. oh, which is funny that. enough, isn't yeah, it? Because <laughs> now I'm attacking liberalism. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually won that. Um, they must feel sorry. Why, why did we ever start this? I, I won yeah. that debate. But yeah. from then on, I realized that I think this was the first actual formal thing that I ever did where I could debate and speak and try and convince people. And um, I realized that, you know what, this is something I'm okay at doing, right. okay at communicating with people on a public level. So when I went into university, um, it was something that I continued to do, even though it wasn't something which was maybe as public as it is now, but I was, I had like my course, as you mentioned, is like political science or political philosophy. All the things that I'm debating about now, a lot of those things, as you know, cause you're doing the same kind of course, yeah. isn't it? I had the opportunity to debate those things week in, week out, mm. literally every single week. We would debate about liberalism, we would debate about feminism and communism. So this is not something which has just emerged out of nowhere, right? This is this is my training, if you like, you know, for the last, I would say, 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and so it's something which, as you know, right, you have, we have seminars, we have... And then I started to get into the religious debates because I was studying religion on the side as well. And it's the same kind of principles, you know, you, you learn to make arguments and so on. Yeah. We recently had a, a discussion with another guest and he yeah. spoke about uh, debating uh, in high school and that mm -hmm. they had a separate program for um, students who were able to debate and et cetera. And yeah. he said, that this helped me a lot uh, during my career. And yes. uh, he also does a lot of things in the media. Yes. How do you, um, or what does 
um, debating do to you because I can um, see that it, it gives you a thick skin and it makes you, you're in the field constantly. So you're constantly getting challenged on your, um, on your assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think this has helped you grow, and grow as a person? To be honest, it's a double-edged sword as a, as on a personal level because every time you have conversations with people now, you, you start to identify the flaws in their discussion. Like even if I'm having a discussion with a family member or something, I say, look, what a fallacy that is. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. And Just when you're talking about <laughs> soccer, you know, no, 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 that's, yeah. a, that's a fallacy. Yeah, no, no, honestly, I, I say, so what, what kind of discussion? I, I, yeah. I actually try and analyze everything in terms of the, the arguments, the forms, okay, let's look at the arguments. This person is saying this, and, and then I start thinking, this person is, is illogical, right? And then you could be having a discussion with someone who, like, for example, a f good friend of yours for many years, and they're trying to express something to you. Yeah. And then you object and say, well, actually, that's the fallacy of equivocation. And, uh, or that's, that's a problem because, you know, but that's not the way it actually obscures a lot of communication. If you try and implement that, um, debating style on your personal life. So as a as a personal thing, I wouldn't really say it did much to me or for me. But in terms of obviously being able to communicate ideas on a public level, obviously I think that training is required for that. Yeah. I really do think that. And uh, you said that uh, when you were 12 and 13 years old, you started hearing the anti-Islamic narrative. You were exposed yeah. to it. Yeah. And from that point on, um, you started investigating the Quran, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Can you take us with us from your journey from 12, 13 years old until now? How did that whole process go? So when I was about 12, even even younger, I would say when, when I started going into secondary school. So in the United Kingdom, secondary school starts at about 11 years old, right? Which is year seven, from year seven to year 11. So obviously when you're in that environment, you're first of all, there's lots of people that don't share the same belief system as you. But secondly, you're starting to become an adult now, you know, and in the West, there's a lot of things which are against Islam, a lot of questions which are asked of Muslims and Islam. So all of the questions that kind of are still commonly asked, recycled questions about gender equality, questions about human rights, questions about the punitive laws in Islam, the relationship between Islam and science, um, all of those things, the preservation of the Quran, how do we know the Quran is true? How do we know that Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet? These fundamental questions which are required in order to solidify one's faith, these are questions that I had at a very, very young age, you know, um, like 11 or 12 years old. And so- How come? Uh, why, why so young? So, because a lot of people get uh, exposed to that when they're at an older age? Yeah. Um, I think that I just wanted to know, I was curious, you see. I, it was, I think it was really, it was, it was curiosity that led me to that. I wanted to, to be aware of all of the arguments for and against. Well, and then you make searched a for them. You yeah. went online and just searched for them. Yeah, I would look okay. at it. Yeah. I would speak to people about it. Remember, I had a lot of atheist teachers as well in school, uh, which would actually actively promote atheism in, for example, religious education class, mm. which, by the way, happens. I'm not sure if it happens here in Holland. But it certainly happened in the United Kingdom. Well, religious uh, teaching is divided. So mm. you got, it, it's called Levensbeschouwing. And mm. actually, yeah, they promote atheism. But you're saying that actually the criticism made you investigate your religion more. So the criticism yeah. helped. Yeah, I remember in science class, I explicitly remember some of the teachers were trying to undermine religion with the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. Literally, that, I mean, I remember I was, I was only 14 years old. I remember these are my authorities, right? or 13 years old or 14. And they were talking to me and the whole class, in fact, which, cause I live, I work, um, sorry, I, I went to a inner city school in London, which was probably one of the most diverse schools in London. So there was a lot of Muslims in that class and they, and they were literally kind of like doing their propaganda to all of us, yeah. right? And because they were trying to do their propaganda to us, some of us went and investigated, see, okay, let's see the claim, right? So some of them would try and use the big bang theory you know, to try and undermine the Quran and Islam. They would literally do that. They would say, look, before people used to be religious, you know, that was the claim of, you know, the medieval times, whatever. Now we realize that this is how the universe began. So it's almost as if like they're telling us that religion is wrong, yeah. right? And, and they're trying to undermine our principles using their subject matter. So it's not equal, right? Because mm. we had the same thing. Uh, evolution was pre presented as some kind of truth. And then you had religion, which was another course, Levensbeschouwing, and it was, it was with hedonism and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it was some kind of uh, fairy tale thing and yeah. science was truth. Yes. 
Exactly. So I've had that, that, that narrative was pumped to me at a very young age. I had only a few, and by the way, this is something I've noticed. I'm, I haven't done any checks on this uh, in terms of looking at the actual data just yet. But what I noticed is that Muslim teachers in the UK who are traditionalist Muslim usually weren't given positions in social sciences and humanities. They usually were given positions in maths, uh, potentially, po possibly science, uh, and also IT. So where I would see Muslim teachers would be in subjects which wouldn't affect my opinion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for example, I had a Muslim math teacher, but when we're discussing Pythagoras theorem, that's not gonna make the difference between me being a Muslim or, or a disbeliever. Just it's funny, I actually also had a Muslim uh, math teacher. Did you have the only well? Muslim mm. I had ever You'll, you'll find that, you know, I'm, you're, from my experience, and once again, I haven't done a big survey data on this yet, so I can't give you any exact statistics, but I've realized that, th that humanities departments in particular, um, usually those who are in those departments are people with atheistic uh, narratives, liberal, liberalized narratives. Um, Being portrayed as neutral. Yeah. Right? They're neutral, yeah. so, so we can have So that's how it was in the UK. Yeah. So obviously, yeah. so when you go into history or RE, religious education, and you're going also into science class, yep. and your teacher's telling you, oh, you know, the Big Bang Theory is, is the new explanation for how we got into existence. That made you research it. So it makes me think, okay, well, what happened before the Big Bang? The question now, the philosophical question, which they wanted me to ignore, I went and did an investigation about. Yeah. But so. isn't it a lot of young children, they will not do that investigation and exactly. they will just take it because you exactly. look up to your teachers. You yes. think the school will give me something that's true. Yes. So yeah. if you do not have that critical mind, you will yeah. just yeah. take it as true. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what, this is the problem because what I found was that there was a disconnect between the Muslim community, because the Muslim community, obviously, we can't um, undermine the power of primary socialization. So when, a, when a, a child is born into a family, which is a Muslim family, that is quite a powerful thing because they're more likely to be Muslim by virtue of the fact that they're being socialized like that. But when they go into school now and their teachers are doing that with them, the, usually the parent, if they're second generation in the UK context, maybe not in the US context and maybe not in Amsterdam, but because in the UK, a lot of parents are like, they don't have university education. They don't have the same level of education as the, um, as the teachers in the schools do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. They might have education, but not at that level, right? So they start losing the argument because when the child goes back home and says, well, how can you explain this? That, that parent cannot provide a sufficient answer which, which covers the doubt or solves the doubt of that particular, that particular student. So the student might then go to an imam of the masjid, right? Who once again doesn't have sufficient secular education to, to cope with that, that question. He might give you an Islamic answer, but it's sometimes the Islamic answer is not, it's not enough, frankly, because they've been given secular, you know, um, explanations. You need to have a secular counter, right? So from that perspective, children then start to see the authority. There's a, sh there's a shift in authority from parents and imams and the Muslim community to teachers and, you know, scientists, professors and Western circles. And that's when, that's what you will find when most people make a decision to actually leave the religion or to identify more with the dominant culture of society. Yeah. So at 11, 12, you started doing the research and yeah. you said that at 17, 18, you had a fixed religious personality. Yeah. So yeah. during that period, your yaqeen, your uh, certainty of the religion grew. Uh, can you take us in a high overview um, uh, view and take us with us on, on that journey? How did that go? You know what I mean? So yeah, 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 yeah. What, what were the fundamental questions that you had needed to have answered to uh, come at a point where you had to fix religious personality? Yeah, so it was all of those questions that kind of already alluded to before. What, ha what is this Big Bang? You know, um, what, is, uh, what happened before the Big Bang? How, I, how could atheists... I remember, I, this is... I've never told anyone this before. So we have a premiere. Yeah, yeah, so we have something. I'll tell you something that happened. I, I one time was... I was about 13 years old. I was near eight, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually doing this research late at night, yeah? So I was like um, watching this documentary because there was YouTube at this time, right? I'm not that old, by the way. <laughs> so there was YouTube at this time and I was watching, I think it was YouTube, and I was watching this documentary, yeah? About, um, I think it was multiverse or a string theory or something like that, yeah? And there was this atheist, 
I remember exactly what he said and I remember exactly how I reacted, yeah? <laughs> there we go. So yeah. describe the scenario first. So, so I was in your sit- bedroom? I was in my bedroom. Okay. Okay, I was sitting down. It, it was, was at about night? 12 at night. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. And I was sitting on there and watching this guy right. talking about the... He, and then he said this, he said... So he was trying to trivialize the universe, right? He said, we know now, and um, we know now how the, you know, the universe came about. And if we wanted to... Yeah, we could make our own universe, yeah? That's a big claim. So so when he said that, I don't know, wallahi, this is, yeah, this is what happened. I actually felt very angry, yeah? (laughs) (laughs) As a 13-year-old. So so I had this laptop, I punched the laptop. (laughs) (laughs) It was a smart thing, right? (laughs) And that's when martial arts journey started. (laughs) Wallahi, I punched the laptop and it broke. (laughs) Obviously, (laughs) obviously. You know, I wasn't that weak, you know, at that time. I was on my laptop, it was my sister's laptop. <laughs> Makes it less worse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was, my sister, I said, and then my mom the next morning, she says, what happened? I didn't tell her the whole story. Like, I think she'd think I was some kind of crazy. But that day, by the way, I went to sleep. And this again might sound a bit weird, it? so I went to sleep. And you know when you get sleep paralysis? Yeah. Mm. So when you go to sleep and then the the... the I believe it was shaitan, you know, I believe it was the devil. <laughs> a scary black figure. I believe in. the devil was trying to corrupt my, my, um, me. Right, yeah. Right. So I heard this thing in my ear. It was like. <sighs> <laughs> this is intense. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah honestly. You, you just punch the laptop. <laughs> you're hearing sounds in your yeah, ear. Yeah, yeah, honestly. And after that, uh, you know, I was, I couldn't move. I was, I could, I could feel my awareness, but I couldn't, mm. for some mm-hmm. reason I couldn't move it. So I started reciting Quran and stuff like that. Then it left. And I was thinking, what's going on? Like, you know, mm. what's, what's happening right now? Yeah. Anyway, I mean, this sounds like a weird story. It's just my experience. I mean, so I felt like what was going on was that Allah was putting me through a test. Yeah. That, that test was one where I was going to go through my own discovery. I was going to be introduced to the most uh, contemporary doubts. I was going to overcome that. And then after I overcome that, and I know the answer to that, I was then going to help people with that. One of the things that made you overcome it was the Quran, right? Because you yes. started reciting, so that's very metaphorical. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you said that you did an uh, in-depth investigation into the Quran yes. between those years. Yes. So what were the, um, if you can recall those times, what were the uh, mm. ayat or the, the, the suwar that uh, really helped you strengthen the certainty in, in this religion? So I, first I looked at the Quranic claim, which that there's no contradiction in the Quran. Yeah. And then I looked at what, let's see the people who say that there is contradiction in the Quran. Okay, let's see what they say. So I, I went to the non-Islamic websites. And by the way, here's a big thing that people didn't know as well. Yeah. David Wood is older than me. So I, when I was a teenager, he was maybe like, I don't know how old he was. Yeah. But he's a little bit older. He's not, he's not that much older, but he's older than me. Yeah, right? He studied his work. I yeah. saw his, I knew of David Wood when I was a teenager. I knew of this guy. And do you know what I said? I said, one day, wallahi, yeah, when I was probably about, I knew of him and another guy called Sam something, yeah? Those two guys, I knew about them when I was a teenager. You know what would make the story way cooler? Oh. If the scientist you watched was David Wood. <laughs> <laughs> and, <he smashed> and then you had the debate. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the debate you said, I smashed him. <laughs> like it all came out. Skin. <laughs> Basically, I was preparing for David Rufus. Right, right. right. Yeah, <laughs> since you were 12. <laughs> no, no, like, so I knew of his arguments. I knew of this guy's, because there was a particular website, which I'm not going to advertise, which had certain articles, yeah? And I was using that website as a teenager. I'm talking 14 years old, honestly, yeah? 14. I was using that website as a template to navigate the main contradictions, the main claims against Islam. Remember, I was a teenager at this time, yeah? And I was thinking, okay, let's see what they have to say. So I looked at each and every claim. Can you give us one, uh, like, really concrete example of, okay, I saw this claim, and then I studied the Quran, and then I found this. Let me give you an example of a claim, right? So in Surah Surah Maryam, yeah? There's there's a discussion of uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ya ukhta Harun. Ya Ukhta Harun, he's talking about uh, Mary, he says, oh, sister of Aaron, yeah? And so the Orientalist claim is that, and this was on that website and it's on many websites, the Orientalist claim was that, oh, you know, the Quran got it wrong because Mary, Mary mm-hmm. is not the sister of Aaron. And there was a woman called Miriam who was the sister of 
Aaron. So the Quran confused Mary and Miriam. That was that, the claim. That was the claim, yeah. right? And uh, why would it be called? Because Mary is the mother of Jesus. Mm. Yeah. And Aaron is the, is the brother of Moses. So the Quran saying, Ya Ukhta Harun, O sister of Aaron, yes, is, is a contradiction or is problematic because, yeah? In the gap in time. Because how could it be, right? Yeah. So I thought about this. And even at this age, I was thinking deeply about these things, yeah? Say, so wait a minute, this, does, this, contradic this supposed contradiction doesn't... At first, you, you think of it and you think, well, wait a minute, that's, it sounds like a really great you know, presentation there, you know? You've made your argument and they, they, you know, they quote academics, they'll make it sound good. But then I thought about it more deeply, right? The claim is that the Quran says that Moses is Jesus's uncle, basically. That's the claim. Because if you think about it, if, if Mary is the sister of Aaron yeah. and Mary is the mother of Jesus, that means Aaron is the uncle of Jesus, means Moses is the uncle of Jesus. But really, if we look at the Quran, let's be fair and honest, and the Hadith, yeah? Does the Quran depict Mary and Jesus, uh, or Mary and Moses as being in the same epoch? It doesn't at all. One of them is in Egypt, and the other one is in, you know, uh, Jerusalem or wherever she is, and going to a... So it's completely like, when, when you think about it like that, yeah, and I thought, when you try and look for a contradiction of the Quran, you end up making a claim which is impossible. So why did the Quran say, Ya Ukhta Harun? Because she was from that lineage. She goes all the way back. And you, then I realized that the importance of the Arabic language. Right. Yeah. Because this kind, of, this kind of terminology is understood to the Arabs. Like even Kathir mentions, many different Mufassirun mentioned. This is something, okay, when you mention the lineage of someone, and, with, and he gave examples of how that's done, Ya Bani Ta, Ya Ibn Tamim or whatever, it's, it's been done by the Arabs. So I realized that these Orientalists were clutching on straws. And the more I looked at their supposed contradictions at that very young age, the more actually this process strengthened my faith. I know it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but when you, and I'm not saying that this is a method anyone should employ, by the way, but yeah, it, just, yeah, right. it just happened to me, yeah, right? Yeah. When you realize, okay, I've looked at pretty much, like I'm pretty much familiar with the majority of common um, so-called inconsistencies in the Quran because I've been researching it for a very long time, yeah? But when you look at all of that and you realize how shallow the claim is or how problematic the claim is or how foolish the claim is, then you realize when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know, If it was from other than God, they would have found many contradictions. But when you see those individuals try and find contradictions in the Quran and they fail time and time again, one of the one of the alleged contradictions is, I mean, this might sound a bit ridiculous. The Quran says, "Don't say three. And the the guy was like, "You know, don't say three, but when you say the verse, you're saying three. <laughs> they didn't understand the concept, the context, right? It's about Trinity. Don't say right? Trinity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So he's saying, but when you say the verse, you're saying three. So you're saying we got it. We found a contradiction. Yeah, we found a contradiction. <laughs> yeah. so, but I thought, let's let's go with their yani, way of thinking. It says ولا تقول ثلاثة. It doesn't say ولا تقول ثلاثة even. Hmm. So it says, don't say it all together. Don't say three. So even so, it's not like we're all coming holding hands and saying three. Like, <laughs> do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So even when you go down that route of of they're trying to like kind of prove a contradiction of the Quran, from their logical perspective, it doesn't work. So when I realized that all of their attempts were feeble and that the Quran was something which is immune to contradiction, this was my first like real right. like realization. So what I find really interesting, um, when you watch the, your debates, yeah. you see that you have a strong fundament in Islamic theology and at the same time, um, a strong fundament in academics. And not only in academics, but also in modern day um, uh, conversations, discussions, liberalism, et cetera, et cetera. So can you describe to us how did you go about your process of um, basically becoming a student of knowledge? How did this process start? Where did you start? And uh, looking back on it, like what, you know what I mean? What was the process? Can you describe to us that? Because a lot of students who are listening right now, um, I know a lot of them have the same ambition. Like I want to have a strong religious fundament and a strong academic fundament. So how did your journey go? So as I was doing my research as a teenager, I was also, as you know, like kind of 
interested in polemics and discussion, debate and all those things. Yeah. So when I came to choose my A-levels, I chose A-levels which are very much centered in the social sciences um, and which allowed me to kind of continue the debate, if you like, you know, and learn the secular sciences and so on. Um, and at the same time, I realized that at a very young age, maybe at the age of 14 or 15, that in order for me to really get to the bottom of these arguments, the Quranic arguments and so on, I need to learn the Arabic language, the Fusha. I need to be familiar with the Quran. I need to be memorize it. I need to all of those things. So it wasn't something I did as many Muslims do when they are very young. I didn't start at the age of seven or six or five. I didn't go to Quran school at that age. Alhamdulillah, my mom taught me Arabic, like the conversational Egyptian Arabic. And I knew some fundamentals of how to pray and stuff like that. And all of that was there, but I didn't have a robust learning from like, say, the age of seven or eight. I didn't have that. So I had to start when I was about 15 or 16. So I started doing everything that I've just mentioned, like, you know. So where did you literally start? I I started by trying to, because remember, I was doing my GCSEs at that time as well. What's that? GCSEs is one level before A-levels. Okay. So in the UK system, you have GCSEs, two years. A levels two years and then university after that and then and so on. So I was doing my GCSEs at that time, so I couldn't devote a lot of time, but I started doing bit by bit, you know, learning Arabic. I remember going through the whole programs online, like um, uh, the Medina program. I went through right. that Medina. So program. you didn't visit an Arabic country or something. To I study. went to Egypt a few times. Um, but to be honest, the majority of learning was done in the UK. My mom was an Arabic teacher, so that's her background. So I, I wanted to learn. She was very busy because, as you might know, like she was a single mother and she had lots of things to deal with. So I couldn't really, at that time, tell her to you know, sit down with me. When I got a bit older, that did happen. So I benefited from my mom a lot. If I, she wasn't there, I wouldn't have been able to progress, to be honest with you. It would have been impossible. I did an A-level in Arabic as well. Um, I decided to do that. And so I, I just put myself in so many courses and I wanted to do as much formal learning as possible so that I can finish things. I like to start and finish things. You know, I like to start and finish things. You know, um, I don't like to start something and not finish it. Mm. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time doing my, my, my studies like that. I went through all of the Medina books I went through all of the, like all the things that were out there, you know, I, right. I spent maybe I would say hundreds of hours, you know, researching uh, what was out there in English language. Then I went to the Arabic. Then I started when I got older and stuff like I realized that, okay, there's a, there is a, actually a program for to al Ilm, if you like. So I started students going of through knowledge. students of knowledge. So I went through it. I went through, I'm still going through it right now. Even. Yeah. And what does that look like? So it looks like the, typically, okay. Language acquisition, first and foremost, yeah. Uh, I, I believe there's a big problem in the way that is done in the West, where people want to learn Arabic, yeah, or any other language. The, how it looks is you have called the grammar translation model, which is the weakest model in terms of picking up a language, which is that literally, the, sorry to say, like the Medina books way, yeah? Mm -hmm. Which is you have like, uh, I'm not saying the Medina books are bad. I've went through them myself. I know all about them, yeah? yeah. And they give you a strong base in, in the grammar, but they don't give you a strong base in communicative Arabic, being able to read and understand, being able to speak and listen. Listen to lectures. And that's yeah. the most important thing. I mean, if I were to pause anyone in English language or in Dutch and tell them to break it down syntactically and grammatically, people wouldn't be able to do that. But... If I were to speak to them, they'd know how to communicate with me at the end of the day. And so when you're reading, that's the most important thing. So the, I think the thing that actually helped me the most in terms of learning Arabic Fusha, you'll be surprised, I think is just communication itself. So being able to speak to my mom in Fusha, being able to do the A-level and writing essays in, in Arabic, those things there, they were more effective than any grammar translation thing I've ever done. And so I believe that the grammar translation model, where you literally have a, a sentence and you break it down grammatically and so on, that's limited and it should be employed to a certain extent. At one point in my life, I did something called a CELTA program. And a CELTA program is a certificate from Cambridge University. They do like teaching English as a foreign language. And what they, um, what they do is something called 
what they rely on is something called communicative approach in linguistics. The communicative ap approach is literally um, what I've just described. So you're trying to engage and elicit from, it's a student-centered approach, number one. A lot of these language um, acquisition courses are not student-centered. They're almost lecture-based, which is real problematic when it comes to language. I recently spoke to an Arabic teacher and he yeah. told me that um, if you're learning Arabic and you're doing it really structured and you have an hour every day, he said, that's not a way to do it. You need to be a cha chaotic with learning Arabic. You need to delve <laughs> into it and just have this recording, this lecture, this this book, this book, and you really need to dive into it. And he also yeah. criticized the, uh, the view to start immediately with the grammar because you need to understand the lectures. You need to... Mudaf, mm. mudaf, right? All right, good to be able to... Uh, <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> yeah. And, dive into, uh, yeah, exactly. into the language. Uh, yeah. uh, so there's, there is a combination of things that's required. Yeah. Um, Grammar is one of them, but it's not the only thing. Communication is the key thing, right? So actually reading, trying to translate things yourself, speaking with someone, you know, listening, that's important. That's the most important thing. You will learn Arabic like that. You learn any language like that. And it isn't out there yet, you were saying. I don't know. Like I, I saw Bayina, Bay, you know Bayina. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a true Bayina. Yeah, they, they rely on the grammar translation, but they can't do anything other than that because actually... They're on YouTube or on social media. What can you do? Yeah. You can't elicit conversation. I think they know full well that, you know, the communicative approach is more superior, but probably in their own institution in Texas or whatever, they do that, right? But in terms of online platforms, it's going to be problematic because it's always going to be limited by, okay, so one-way communication. You, and language is never one way. Language is always going to be two ways. So I'm not saying that these things are limited, But uh, these things are not useful, but they're always going to be limited. You're always going to need to put yourself in a, in a immersed um, situation where at least, you know, you're, 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 you're conversing with people. You're the advice the Arabic teacher language. gave me is just listen to lectures. Just listen, listen, listen. If you, even if you understand just 10%, you build it up. Yeah. And in, in the talk to people, talk to people who know the yeah, language. It's good to and go just through a program as well. But yeah. one that is, I would say, based on a communicative approach. Right. So th those programs are there. They're out there and some institutions, I'm not sure in Holland, but they do implement those. So I would, there, there are different methods. There's a method called the Callan method, which is fully conversational. There's a method, which I said is a grammar translation module, which is fully grammar. I think there's a middle way somewhere. And I, and I think that we need to look for that when we're looking for, you know, an Arabic school or something like that. So what going back to what I was saying is that I knew that Arabic was in, the key, right? In order for me to access books, in order for me to, to know the Quran properly and all those things. Right. So I had to start doing that. It took time and it wasn't easy. Yeah, I, you know, Egyptian Arabic is not Fusha Arabic. It's almost, I would say it's a different language. It's way though. different, right? Yeah. It's a different language, bro. You know, it's really and truly, it's a different language. The grammar is different. The words are different. It's a combination of Arabic and al al Qiptiya, yeah. the Coptic language. Yeah. So it's a, it's a different language. So you finished the Arabic and then you went on the... The knowledge trajectory, basically, because yes. you had this this yeah. this 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 fundament. Yeah. So um, what I find really interesting when uh, watching uh, your debates is you're also you're often very aware of the books that are out there. Uh, so, for example, you're debating with a feminist, you can quote them the books, you can tell them, "Hey, have you read this? This?" You can even tell a feminist, "Hey, page forty five, <laughs> right? Have you read this?" <laughs> But this shows that you have a habit of reading, um, which is getting less and less in these times because we have smartphones and we have technology, etc. People are more um, inclined to visual stimulation, etc. Um, how did you go about making a habit out of reading? And what would you advise someone who wants to start reading but doesn't do it often enough? You know what I mean? Yeah, I was forced to read because I had to for, for the many courses that I did in my life, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, That was one thing. I have to be honest with you. It's not something I uh, initially had an impetus to do as a 14-year-old guy. You know, I, I read because I was curious and because I was forced to do it through courses and because um, it was something that was I had to do in the in the beginning, in the early stages. And after that, any anything worth having in life doesn't come easy, right? As one of my teachers used to say to me, you know, anything worth having in life doesn't come easy. And If you have a habit of reading, that's a gift in and of itself. Not the fact that you're reading, but that you are, that you have a motivation to read. Having a motivation to read is a gift that you've been given that, especially in an area or in a time period in life where you're being stimulated, as you said, by so many other things. So 
Um, I had to read, and it wasn't easy in the beginning. When you go through, we all have to read. When you, I'm sure you're aware, right? We go through um, school and so on. And then afterwards, I realized that, look, these are important points that are being made. And I realized the value of written word compared to, for example, spoken word. When someone writes something down there, they're literally putting their most important ideas on paper. And books are one of the most important, if not the most important things a civilization can provide. Definitely. And if you're deprived of that, then you're deprived of a big part of humanity, right? Because if you think about really and truly, what are books? Books, if you, if you didn't have books, you wouldn't have civilization. You know, if you, if you delete all books from, from the face of the earth, then we're going we're gonna to go back to, you know, a prehistoric age almost, right? So if you realize the value of everything that is, you know, a knowledge and that is worthy of um, having as a knowledge comes from books, then you realize, okay, I need to systemize my reading. But it shouldn't be something random or haphazard. It should be something which is, okay, I'm doing it for this reason. I'm, I'm reading these books to understand this. I saw a lecture yeah. of Muhammad, Mufti Muhammad Munir and he spoke about uh, reading and the virtues of reading and he referenced it to the Quran. Like how many times does the Quran talk about Kitab, the book, and yes. it references to the Quran as a book and yes. uh, the pen, etc., etc. So basically that it's implemented there. So your yeah. political science, uh, Betshish, yes. right? It probably yes. stimulated you a lot to keep on reading because yesterday you mentioned Hobbes, you mentioned Immanuel Kant. Yes. I'm curious, did your, did your university also motivate you to be critical to these thoughts to these ideologies my my university was um i had a big um kind of marxist influence in the political science department you did yeah so i remember one time i was i didn't know this guy was a marxist or lie i had a second year like uh, essay on Karl marx or something like yeah. that yeah and i was attacking him and said this is and, and that's why you know it's been and it's not relevant anymore now in society and whatever and then you got an F. <laughs> <laughs> I got a low grade. And, and you know, I saw the paper and I was thinking, why did they give me a low grade? And I looked to the sides, like, you know, the annotations. And I was thinking, this guy's, this guy's fighting back. And I'm thinking, yeah. boy, I'm a second year student. Here. Do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah. This guy's a big professor. Yeah. And in fact, he was one of the leading professors in his field. And he's attacking me on every detail and stuff like that. I'm thinking, what's going on here? So I, I did research on him. I realized he was, in, he was a Marxist. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it does stimulate debate. Basically, what you need to realize is that, especially if we're talking about people who are, if we're talking about a subject matter, which relates to what people believe, you need to get the details right, you know? Um, if we're talking about Christianity or Islam, if we're talking about, you know, liberalism or feminism, these are things people take very seriously. Yeah. You know, you can't just talk, you can't just have opinion, an opinion on all those things. That's, that's the mistake a lot of Western commentators have. You have an opinion on Islam. Jordan Peterson comes out, you know, I have an opinion on Islam. He says, I'm ignorant of it. Then he proceeds to give, giving his opinion. And one day you want to criticize them. They want you to come up with loads of arguments. Yeah. No, they, they treat it as if it's like, you know, let's not, we don't need to have a, an in-depth understanding. It's something like, if you, know, you talk about Islam or any of those things, you need to have a good understanding of what you're talking about. You need to spend some time reading, right? And asking and conversing and debating and all those things. And so I didn't come out just yesterday saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to um, refute liberalism. I'm going yeah. to refute feminism. Yeah. And I don't, I, by the way, I don't recommend anyone does that. I spent years do, uh, doing it's the process, research. Yanni, you... Yeah, as you have, right? Because yeah. uh, we, we studied this thing in university. We did it on a postgraduate level. We had maybe about... If you add up all of the, the little classes I had, maybe I had 200 uh, debates on yeah. this. Maybe I had 200 debates on this. And I had how many essays have I written on it? And how many times have I been refuted before I came out on YouTube to speak about the thing? So it's not, it's not something I've just come out and decided to do, right? Um, so yeah, I think that reading allows you not to make a fool out of yourself. Right. You're in touch with what the discussion yeah, is. What is the, the discussion? discussion? What is you yeah. can know more about what someone else believes than they do yeah. about what they, they they believe themselves by going straight to the books. So um, yeah, yesterday we had a main conversation. You did a case study, right? On okay, what are the what are the differences between liberal system and Islamic system? And you say okay, you got to keep reading to have the knowledge about the liberal ideology. But how would you advise like the average Muslim student to to deal with these 
well, conflicting theories and to keep up to date and be able to defend themselves in these types of conversations? I don't, not, not everyone needs to do what me and you did and mm -hmm. go and do like politi political philosophy yeah. university. Not everyone needs to, and can do that. Yeah. It's because to expect that from someone, it's like saying to someone, okay, go and do computer. Imagine someone coming to us and say, go and do computer science. Yeah, I was saying that. You know, so, thank you. <laughs> so you can understand the discourse of, you know, Java. And by the way, I did a course on that. <laughs> you know, did for, you like it? And um, I found it was really beneficial, actually. I did a data analysis course uh, some time ago on, uh, you know, Python and, uh, what do you call it, Excel. And yeah. But what I realized by doing that course is, man, this is not my field, man. Do you yeah. know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. You can't learn what someone's done for three years in three weeks, which is what I tried to do. <laughs> um, but I did it for, for work-related reasons uh, back in the day. But the point is, um, Al-Ghazali, uh, he wrote an interesting book called Maqasid al-Falasifa, which is the objectives of the philosophers. And he talked about basic... He made Al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah, two individuals who are the most, I would say, two iconic individuals in Sunni Islamic intellectual thought. That's my claim in it. So those two individuals are the most iconic and the most influential in Sunni Islamic intellectual tradition. Both of them uh, did rationalization. I wouldn't say they did philosophy. That would be not correct because they both, they, they did tathmim of philosophy. They, um, they they criticize philosophy. Yeah, they but in order to do, philosophy, they knew right? what yeah. they, both of those men knew what they were talking about. Yeah. They didn't make a fool of themselves. They went into when they were refuting the philosophers, they did it on their principles. They did it properly, you know? Yeah. Not everyone needs to do what Al Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah did. But what one can do is reference back to Al Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah, which is basically what I do, for example, in the um in the in the case of the existence of God. Yeah. yeah? All you have to do is, because that was there back in the days, it was an issue back in the day, so I don't need to reinvent the wheel, I'll just take their ideas and, you know. Um, you just go back to what those individuals say. So if you have people like me or you or someone who's, okay, we've studied this thing for X amount of years, you don't need to do what I did. You don't need to do that. Or would you say they would need a basic understanding yeah because what helped me a lot was Absolutely. this course it was about uh, methodology and stuff and we had the philosophy of science yeah. and that is when i discovered for myself that science doesn't even claim to be an objective truth absolutely it comes up with workable models exactly and that changed everything for me then i realized hey this is something good because the average atheist they will be like well it's proven through science and you're like no no science doesn't claim that it's an absolute truth mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's exactly the, the, the balance I would strike as well. I'll say that what people like special subjects, specific specialists yeah, have to do, if, if someone's a ge geologist or a psychologist, they have to kind, I would say, they, they put their subject matter forward and try and understand the religious narrative and connect, make connections. And then people who want to understand psychology from an Islamic perspective should go to those individuals who are legit, who have been who have gone through the process and given us the answers. So we don't need to go through their process, but we just, we need to pay attention to what they say. Yeah. So I don't need to go through the same process that Ghazali went through. I don't need to go through the pro same process Ibn Taymiyyah went through, but I can listen to both of those individuals and I can extrapolate from that. And then use it for yourself. Yeah, use it for myself and protect myself, frankly, yeah. because when I know their arguments, no atheist is going to come and say to me X, Y, Z, because their arguments are enough. There's to protect solids. myself yeah. from atheism for the rest of my life. Yeah. And on a practical level, how do you see the influence on liberalism on the Muslim community nowadays? Because um, one of the things that I often see is uh, we had a course also where liberalism was mentioned, was a course from Isa. And um, uh, you often hear nowadays that people say, uh, when you give them advice, religious advice, they say, who are you to tell me that? And when you uh, go back a little, you see that liberalism talks about the removal of um, an external criterion. Uh, authority. An external mm. authority. Um, and everybody can decide for themselves what's right or wrong. So when you give someone advice, hey, what you're doing is wrong, they can tell you, who are you to tell me that? Because we're equal, right? So th that's one of the forms that I've noticed that liberalism affects Muslims themselves. How do you see liberalism affect Muslims? Remember, the Muslim Muslims in the West and now even in the East, they're born into um, a paradigm where liberalism is the dominant ethic. Yeah. yeah? So obviously, there it's going to affect them because when we talk about morality, it's almost always goes back to democracy and liberalism. So if mm -hmm. I say it's undemocratic, I might as well say it's bad. Yeah. Mm. 
If I say it's illiberal, I might as well say it's bad. This is the same attack that they use nowadays on Muslim institutions, etc. They Absolutely. preach uh, undemocratic values, etc., etc. Yeah. yeah. So I might as well say bad values, right? But we say, okay, to what extent is uh, democracy good? Good. Yeah. Churchill said, right, it's the least worst thing we have. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah, they, yeah. He never called it good. It's, 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 yeah, exactly. He says it's the... Um, what is it? It's the... Least worst something. It's the worst, yeah. It's, least worst. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the... Something like that. Less yeah, of the like, two evils. It's, yeah. it's um, it's not the best thing, but it's the it's the best of the worst systems. Yeah, kind of something thing. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so to to what extent? I mean, even in Western philosophy, there's discussion about that, right? Yeah. Even Plato's uh, yeah. criticized uh, philosophy. But on a practical uh, level, like, how do you see it influence day to day Muslims when you speak to them? You know what I mean? Yeah, it does. It influences them because this. I remember going to Egypt, man. I was in Egypt. I was in the. I was in the taxi. You know, and you can gauge public opinion in Egypt through taxi conversation. Right. <laughs> I was in Alexandria and I was, I was like to the guy, because uh, this was after, you know, the revolution or whatever you want to call it, right? And then I was driving and um, he was saying to me, look, I, I don't care about this politics things. I believe. <laughs> I, said him, I said to him, what do you mean? He said, <laughs> you are free. You are free to do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Right. I said, where did you get this from? Hops. <laughs> I said, where did you get this from? I said, where did you get this from? I read it on Facebook. <laughs> I said, where did you get this from? Yeah. Well, I started humiliating the guy. I, 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 you know, my mom, my mom and sister were there with me as well. I said, where did you get this from, man? I said to him, what you turn the music down because he had the music. Oh, uh, <laughs> you were going after him. <laughs> I, said, I said to him, turn the music down. I said, hold on. I said, where did you get this from? He goes, you know, it's aql. Well, I said, it's, it's just, he, he said, it's this rational. is aql. Yeah. This is your rational. I said, okay, this comes from this book and it comes from this place and it comes from this place and this place, place, place and, and this is why you believe in it. And right. do you believe in that? I said, it was speaker's corner in the car. I, 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 I gave him an incest <laughs> argument as well. I said, so, do you believe that, you know, a mother and, yeah. and that? And I said, you know, because this is, you know. yeah. I said, so what do you think? <laughs> he goes, you know, I don't care about any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> you just because wasted just, your I, whole vacation. I just want to live life and then, yeah. you know, have bread for my family or something, some mediocre thing. That's the problem, like right? Most of them, they don't even want to engage in discussion. It's like, I do my thing, you can have a different opinion, yeah. but this is me. I don't even care about your opinion. Let's not discuss yeah. it. Or the statement, yeah. don't judge. Yeah, I'm that kind of thing. It's, and the guy like was smoking so cigarette. it's so subtle, yeah. I, you know, I think my sister told them to throw the cigarette because it's just making a smoke and they're, you know. Yeah. Harm and the guy was driving and had music. I said, turn the music down. You know, and the guy was talking about, you know, harm principle and this guy is in Egypt and he has no, no idea where what he's saying comes from. Imagine you don't have any idea what you're saying comes from. When we spoke about, um, like people, for example, telling you um, um, whenever you do something, like it's really subtle you see someone have a conversation and they speak about yeah i saw this person um, um smoking weed or whatever but hey i don't judge like that's liberalistic yeah. you don't judge everybody can do what they want to do as long as they don't harm anyone and so the course we had with isa it spoke about being a muslim teaches you morality what's right and wrong mm -hmm. so being a muslim necessarily you need to have a framework uh, yeah and a value opinion yeah. about what somebody is doing whether yeah. it's right or wrong so this is a clear uh, contradiction or, or someone where you see that liberalism and being a muslim battles with each other and i think a lot of muslims battle with this like yeah, mm, i don't want to judge but at the same time islam tells you what's right and wrong so actually because we have an objective to truth, judge the right? action right not the person itself this thing, I don't judge. It's not even. It's not even liberal. I mean, it's it's just a nonsense thing people say nowadays, because because they want to just be left alone to do whatever they want. Right. Everything you do has a consequence. Yeah. You know. I mean, you couldn't use that in the court of law, could you? Mm. <laughs> you say I'm coming in. You know. Don't Only God me. can judge me. <laughs> don't, 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 don't judge me. But I'm. You know. But I am the judge here. You know. I am the. <laughs> right. But this is the. Mm. This is the thing. Yeah. Uh, we're all responsible for our actions, and this this don't judge thing is a is a, a symptomatic, in my opinion. Yeah, it's symptomatic of um, a greater rights culture that we have, and the lack of responsibility culture that we we have. Yeah. So we want to deplete all of our transactions from responsibility as possible. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be responsible for anything. We just want to live life, yeah. enjoy. But to what extent yeah. is the don't judge principle, if even if, or statement? 
to what extent is that even justified? We judge people on a daily basis yeah. on their performances as human beings, as husbands, as wives, as mothers, as children. Yeah. You can't, a child can't say to their mother, don't judge. But isn't the problem don't, that- Don't do the homework, don't judge me. <laughs> they take the subjective approach of, well, let's say it's not even liberalism, you say, and not the Islamic approach of objective uh, norms and values. Mm. So they say we cannot judge, but actually, the deed is already judged, like it has been declared, allowed, not allowed. And we are too scared to name it somehow. Absolutely. That's yeah. where you see a lot of young Muslims, they don't want to say anything like, okay, we think that is bad. But you can come out for it, right? Uh, exactly. And the Quran told us, you know, the people who, Al-Amr al-Ma'roof wa nahi al-Munkar. Yeah. And Al-Amr al-Ma'roof is, from our Islamic perspective, is command. And by the way, they're not the same thing, by the way. And this is people, some people get this really wrong. And we were having a discussion about this with the brother yesterday actually. Al-Amr al-Ma'roof is commanding to that which is good, yeah? And the nahi al-Munkar is uh, forbidding that which is mm -hmm. bad. Mm. So it's obviously a dinu nasiha. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, a dinu nasiha. He says that the religion is advice. So Al-Amr al-Ma'roof is telling people what's good. But that doesn't always mean that when you tell people what's good, that you're telling them to avert that which is bad. So let me give you an example, right? A sunnah, or in there's ahkam al khams. There's five, you know, divisions of um, ahkam of rulings, yeah. and you have wajib, you have mustahab, you have mubah, you have makruh, and you have haram. Obviously, the Hanafis have two more, which we're not going to talk about, because not because I not yeah. because it's wrong, because I don't know much yeah. about the. Hanafis. So this is the spectrum between something yeah. being clearly this is this is forbidden. the spectrum. You have five things, right? Yeah. You have something which is haram. Yeah. You have something which is makruh. You have something which is mubah, which is halal. Halal and mubah mean the same thing. You have something which is mustahab. Uh, did I say mustahab? Yeah? I, I'm not saying it. Yeah? No. And you have something which is wajib. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the five things which is obligatory. Now, just to quickly, mubah or halal is something that you don't get. You don't get sin for if you leave it off, and you don't get um, you don't get reward for if you do it. Yeah. That's the definition. Standard. Middle ground. Yeah. yeah. Wearing a grey. Uh... Yeah, anything I want, yeah. if it's mubah, eating chicken is mubah, it's yeah. halal, it's not haram, unless it's the meat is haram, whatever. but it's halal, right? Yeah. Now, if I say to someone, do something which is sunnah, if I say to them, go and, you know, do the, uh, the duha prayer, I'm doing al-amr bil-ma'roof, but I'm not doing a nahi al-munkar, because I'm not, if they, if they don't do the duha prayer, they're not doing anything wrong. No sin. So Al-Amr al-Ma'roof can range from Mubah up until mus Mustahab and uh, Wajib, sorry. Whereas Anahi al-Munkar can only go from Mubah down to Haram. So if I say to someone, stop drinking alcohol, that's Anahi al-Munkar. So wh Forbidding why this is evil. important, yeah. why this is very important, because what about Al-Umur al or Something like, for example, wearing Niqab for a woman. Now a woman can't say to a woman, another woman, that so, for example, she wears niqab, yeah? And she believes it's farida. She believes it's oblig oblig obligatory to wear niqab. She can't go to another woman and say, okay, well, actually, you're committing a sin for not wearing it. Because you can say, you can, you, you, she can go, the, the munaqaba can go to the ghair munaqaba and say to her, wear the niqab. That's within her right to do that. Yeah. Say, why? Well, this is good. It's very good for you and whatever, yeah? But if she says, you have to wear it, that's problematic because there's an opinion that says it's, you don't have to wear it, yeah? So she can do al-amr al-ma'roof legitimately, but she can't do al-nahi al-munkar. Why? Because nahi al-munkar here would mean that not wearing niqab is munkar. Yeah, but there's an opinion that says it isn't munkar and so on. Yeah. So knowing the difference between al-amr al-ma'roof and nahi al-munkar is important because a lot of young brothers and sisters, they confuse the two concepts together and they confuse it to mean that let me do amr al-ma'roof as the hadith says, whoever sees munkaran, let him change it with his hand. And if not his tongue, then if not, then in his heart and so on. They confuse that with promoting their own jurisprudential opinion. You know, if they believe this is the right way, let me go that way. And they think they're doing al-amr al -Maruf. They're not, they, they might be doing al-amr al might be. But they cannot be said to always being a nahi al-munkar. So it's important to know what al-amr al and nahi al-munkar is in a nuanced way and to implement it because... The Quran makes it very clear that th there has to be a people always doing that in society. Otherwise, yeah. Allah could destroy us. So we have to find that balance between advising and 
making sure, uh, believing for yourself, you're not judging someone. Mm. Because I think that's the, the tricky part here. A lot of people, they think they're judging right away. If I advise them, yo, go pray or something. Yeah. I'm not judging you doing the Amabil Mahouf, as you just said. Yeah, and uh, there was a story of someone in uh, Birmingham in, in the UK. Some brothers there, they're very tough, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, you know, inshallah, you know, tough brothers and stuff. We have yeah. them in the Netherlands too. You have those guys, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so there was a woman on the, bu- on the bus. And obviously I wasn't in Birmingham. I was told the story from some guy in Birmingham. A woman was on the bus. And this was um, <laughs> Ramadan, yeah. She was eating on the bus. She was like an Asian woman. Mm-hmm. She was eating on the bus. And then the brother was there with his soap. And he said, why are you eating? It's Ramadan, yeah. <laughs> and, and by the way, he goes, and by the way, you should also put hijab on because she wasn't wearing hijab. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> she turned around and said, she said, I'm not even Muslim. Oh. <laughs> that's, there you go. That's an extreme example, isn't it? Yeah. Of someone doing judging, but it's, it's a ridiculous way to, yeah. to yes. do it. Yeah. Sometimes you can see a woman that can be, for example, mutabarrija, like not wearing any hijab, nothing, yeah? But she might have just come into Islam. So there is, there is an element of where, okay, you, you got to withhold judgment until you know the full yeah. thing. And our religion also says, no, don't judge is important because someone might come to you and, and, and report something. Yeah. So they might say, for example, my husband did this to me. My wife did that to me. Yeah. My mom did this to me. My child did that to me. Whatever it may be. Yeah? In Islamic, in the Islamic way of doing things, that's not legitimate to hear one side of the story. And we have many clear hadith. In fact, the Quran talks to us yeah. about the, 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 the story of Dawood and Sulaiman, you know, and how only one side of the story was heard and so on. So don't judge comes into play in those areas where you're, you, you only hear one side of the story, no matter how dreadful it sounds, you know? And this is where I believe the Western institutions have got it right. It's called natural justice in, in law, yeah? Natural justice is the idea that two sides, part of natural justice, the idea of two sides get to, you know, give their side of the story before a judgment is given. Yeah. And if so, someone comes and does backbite and it says, okay, you know, you know, my wife, she's abusing me or my husband, he's ab- so on. Yeah. It might be a very serious claim, but it has to be, it has to be tethered with this notion of don't judge just yet until we see both sides of the story. Because the worst case scenario is you start accusing people of things like adultery and right. things like that. I want to put something uh, forward to you, Mohammed. So we have a Facebook group called uh, Muslim Student and LBA, Muslim Students. And we recently had a post, um, uh, a poll that we did, oh, yeah. um, uh, where we promoted the liberalism events. So oh, we had gosh. some questions and we All put right. them forward. Good, yeah. So statements. one of them was statements, basically. Yeah. Um, being a fe- feminist and a Muslim can be combined. One of the statements. And then people can discuss it and people can also vote for it, on it. Right. So uh, 62% of the people said, yeah, that's possible. You can be a feminist and a Muslim at the same time. Um, and what I often see is that feminism and women's rights are used interchangeably. So I believe in women's rights, so I should be a feminist, right? What does, what, yeah, what's your response to this? I think there's a difference in asking, and I've thought about this a lot, by the way, and I've written a book on this as well. It's coming out. Do you know what it's called? Mm, tell me. It's called Fifth Wave Feminism. Okay, so you made a new wave. Yeah, I made a new wave. <laughs> <laughs> You will be remembered in history like that. <laughs> Mohammed Hijab, fifth wave. Uh, sounds there. very pretentious, so Mohammed. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, it's a small book. It's going to come out. And this, I've actually finished writing it now. So I've, uh, it's a very small book. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to create massive books yeah. nowadays. You can read yeah. it in two hours. And let's keep it short to the point. Short, short and to the point. Yeah. Certain case studies uh, there. And it's, it's part of my, because I did gender studies as part of um, postgraduate studies. Yeah. So it was good to do that because I wanted to hear their perspective. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I've done that book now. It's coming out. My answer to this question after really thinking about it is as follows. I say that there's a difference between asking us to what extent can Islam be compatible with feminism and asking the question to what extent can feminism be compatible with Islam? I think these are two completely different questions. So I would say a feminist can become a Muslim. It's no problem, right? And in fact, there's no contradiction in a feminist being a Muslim. But when we're talking about the second category, which is where you're talking about here, which is a Muslim being a feminist. Now we have to define terms very carefully here because feminism is not easily defined. 
although some people try and give very straightforward definitions like social, political, and economic equality, yeah? That's a basic definition of feminism, which doesn't tell us much. Because the truth is, there's more, as we've kind of discovered, there's more than one wave, yeah? And there's criticism within feminist theory. It's not like feminism is one monolithic thing where, you know, whatever, for example, Fredan says, or De Beauvoir says, or whoever it is says, is the be all and end all. It's gone through uh, a transformation, a transformative process. So I would say this is that if we're looking at intersectional feminism, which is the most, I would say, updated version of third wave discourse. Yeah? What is it exactly? For so the... yeah, the intersectional understanding is that a woman is not just a woman, right? She is a woman. She could be a black woman. She could be a working class black woman. She could be a woman that lives in this. She could be. She could want to identify with herself. As, for instance, in tribal terms, she could want to identify with herself in religious terms. If we employ a robust intersectionality, and this might be a bit complicated, but... Just try to keep it as simple as possible. Let's try and keep it as simple yeah. as possible. If we say that a woman can, can decide how to identify herself in the order in which she wants to identify herself, and she decides to identify herself as a Muslim first and foremost before everything else, That's in line with the intersectional approach. It should be in line with the intersectional approach because the inter intersectional appro approach is it gives you the free reign to prioritize your markers of uh, identification. You're more than just your gender. Yeah, so yeah. for example, a black woman, you can't argue that black um, gender is more important than blackness, yeah. right? Yeah. It's a very difficult argument for someone to make and it wouldn't be accepted in the third wave discourse. So third wave feminism would reject that claim outright, I would say, yeah? That if someone says, I'm a black woman, Who's to determine that black that a womanness is more important than blackness? Yeah. So in the same way, we say, okay, well, if a woman says that religion is more important to her than gender, or the Eurocentric understanding or conceptions of gender, then that should be as legitimate as, uh, as that. So then her religion would be her yeah, framework. Yeah. So her religion becomes first, yeah. and whatever the religious entailment is, yeah. then that is the most thing to be prioritized. Yeah. So I would say, from that angle, it's possible for someone to say, well, you know. From an intersectional perspective, I identify as a Muslim first, and therefore feminism is compatible with Islam. So then someone would say, Islam is my framework, and where feminism fits in with the framework, yeah, I'll take it. Exactly. So here, I would say this, second wave feminism mm -hmm. is not compatible with Islam. Mm -hmm. When we say Islam is jurisprudentially understood as the four schools of thought and so on, and feminism, second wave, how can you argue that that's compatible? Because the argument here would have to be in that, the stances of motherhood and the stances of family and the stances of the, all those things are the same, which they're, so they which they're not, which they're yeah. simply not. Second wave feminists in particular, which when, when we say feminist, we're talking more specifically about second wave most times. Yeah, a lot of people don't even know. What so what does second wave feminism so say? Second wave feminism is pretty tough against the institution of a family, right? It's, it sees that the institution of family is headed by a dominating patriarchal man leader And that's an exploitative, oppressive system for a woman. Where Islam doesn't see that as the case. Uh, second wave feminism has a lot of things to say about a woman being oppressed by being a mother, biologic, by a biological necessity. So we will say that's, that kind of approach, how could that, the question would be, how could that be even conceivably compatible with the Islamic discourse? You had a, they had a guest at this Dutch show called the, the New Man, the New Moon. And he said something very beautiful, I think. He said that, let's take second feminism, for example. Um, he said that it portrays a system in which the men and the women, they are in conflict with each other, they're in competition. Yes. Whereas Islam has a system where they complement each other. Yes. He says that's the main difference between the second wave, for example, and Islamic system. Second wave feminism, is, it, it portray, this is exactly the criticism that, that third wave feminists make, actually, funny enough, is that, The, the discourse of second wave feminism is that men throughout history are the oppressors, the oppressors and women are the oppressed. As simple as that. Right? And intersectional feminism doesn't say this. No, because intersectional feminism is a little bit more nuanced. So what are we talking about? A black man and a white woman? Or a white no. man and a black woman? And that's fair enough because you can't argue that, for example, you know, white women were being oppressed by black, black men in the slave trade. Yeah. When they had them as slaves. Yeah. White women had black men as slaves. So where's the patriarchy now, right? right? So what, what was also an interesting point in, in this discussion is that um, because it's so difficult to define feminism, right? You have the second wave and in f the fourth wave and fifth wave is coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's really difficult to um, know what it means when someone says, I'm a feminist. Yeah. So one of the reactions was, why don't you just say, I'm a Muslim? And does the good that exists within feminism exist within Islam? Yeah, we believe yeah. that Islam is a, a holistic 
approach and a holistic framework to um, to cover these things. And, and what I often see is that uh, the word feminism is thrown out very easily. So uh, recently um, I heard someone say, um, yeah, feminism equals women rights. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came up for women rights. So what he this was one is a to feminist. Write, like really simplistic and problematic. The yeah. problem is the, the knowledge production of feminism, especially second wave, as, as realized by many second wave feminists themselves, is a Eurocentric knowledge production. It's happened in Europe. And so people like Audre Lorde and people like, you know, Bell Hooks, who are very famous in feminism, two of very famous black women, you know, that came out, they were criticizing this. They said, look, you don't know how we feel as black women in America, for example. But then you can extend that criticism and say, well, you white and black people in America don't know how people feel in Africa, yeah. how women feel in Africa. Mm. You don't know how women feel in uh, Asia or China and India. So why have we given legitimacy to a type of feminism, which is very Western in its complexion, quite literally, right? It's very Western in its, um, in its inception, conception, and its proliferation. So we will say that that's an unfair thing to do if what is sought is the representation of women worldwide. Because there's maybe like three or four billion women in the world, yeah? yeah. So why is it the case that maybe a hundred million women or maybe less even, we look at studies now that are done in America, 80% of women identify in America against feminism, according to these studies, right? But what, even then, th that small percentage of women that decide to call themselves feminists or decide to acknowledge that production. Why should they be representative of all of the interests of all of the people? Because the thing is from pure research, we do know, for example, let's be very, let's be straightforward, right? The, the question of husband wife relationships in a, in a household, yeah? And in Islam, there is a leadership system. There is, and the leader is the man in the, in the household. And that's not unrestricted. It's not obviously, there's lots of things and we've done lectures about it and we talked about how where the caps are and the limits of that are. But generally speaking, the husband is seen as the steerer of the ship, if you like. Now that's completely against second wave discourse, yeah? Now the question is, is it against women's interests? Or is it against women's understanding of how things should be? Because if you do the research, you'll find that the majority of Muslim women in the Muslim world, they actually maintain those notions. Like the, the, the biggest studies that are done in, for example, Pew Research and the Gallup poll and all those things, most Muslim women acknowledge that, acknowledge that in the world, we're talking about on a, on a, on a global level. What do they acknowledge? Acknowledge the fact that this ought to, not only this is the case, but this ought to be the case, mm -hmm. that the man should be the leader in the household. Yeah. So the theory of justice of those Muslim women is being undermined by the theory of justice, by West, uh, sorry, those, feministic discourse, yeah, by yeah. Western women who claim to represent all of women's interests, but, but no one voted them into power. If you isn't like. that the problem with most of our theories? Because the West has some hegemony when it money. Yes. Yes. Export it as the most. hegemony when it comes to ideologies, they export it as the most. It means that you are the only world power. You're yeah. hegemon. You're mm -hmm. the main world power. Yeah. Like. You can also see it in military terms, the US was the hegemon. Mm -hmm. So they are the ones that keep exporting their ideologies because we are not influenced by Chinese culture, for example. Perfect. We example, are yeah. by Western culture yeah. and the whole world is influenced by Western culture. Yeah. So we had also had this in school, like we had this, we have this idea that there were never, for example, African philosophers. There were, but their works have never been preserved and they haven't been exported. Mm. So their, their works have been preserved in oral histories and stuff, which the West doesn't seem as, once again, they're, they're the arbitrator of, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Yeah. And for us, the, white, the question is who gave them the power to do that, right? Who, and, and going back to feminism, who gave white, usually it's not only just white, but Western women, right? Who gave them the power to represent the interests of all of the women in the world? What if a woman says to you, I want to be in a relationship, right? That the man can take control of certain tasks and responsibilities. They will just say that she's that's brainwashed. Her, that's, that's her impetus, right? Yeah. That's, that's what she, now you could do two things with such a woman or with such an opinion. You can say your opinion is wrong. Yeah, number one, uh, you know, you need to be enlightened and so yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or you can say that's your opinion, okay? And on feminism, on intersectional feminism, yeah, your opinion it. is as good as mine. Okay. Yeah, it ha they have to say your opinion is as good as mine. There's no reason why the Western Eurocentric opinion, if representation of women is what we're looking for, there's no reason why that opinion should be any more valued than that one. If a woman decides, 
I mean, let's be let's be really controversial, right? Now, this might sound a bit, you know, odd, yeah. But you guys have some odd things here in Amsterdam, yeah. Because th there is a there is a thing in liberal theory, which, by the way, most I, I couldn't say this conclusively, but you could easily say that most feminists are liberal feminists, yeah. So they believe in liberalism as a you know philosophical backdrop to feminism. So they believe in consent. Now, if a woman, you know, this kind of things that they do in, sorry to say, in a sexual thing, you know, when they have like a whip or something and they, and they hit each other. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand what I'm talking about? BSM, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So this <laughs> thing, think about what's happening here, right? I will ask you a question. Here in Holland, yeah, if a woman decides I want to engage in such sexual activity, yeah, with some man, and she consents. She says, you can whip me whilst we're doing the sexual act. What's actually going on there? Let's unpack it from all, you know, from all the things that it could be, you know, uh, guys with. Number one, what's going on is that she's telling him to hit her. The man is in the position, yeah? And vice versa, it could happen the other way around. But he's, she's, she's giving him to permission to what would in any other context be seen as assault. And the funny thing is, you got a movie like Fifty Shades, right? And it's like a big hit, and everybody goes to it, and you they did, love you the didn't story. Watch this, did you? I didn't watch it. I don't watch movies stuff a lot. <laughs> I was actually you to watch it for a study. Yeah. I, I didn't know what <laughs> it was. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's from Hajj Darura. Yes, it's a I, I was only introduced to that one. One of my students one time, she was a she was a girl reading this book, and I said, "What what book is this?" And she quickly put it in her pocket. Mm, you know, ah. I said, "What is this book?" And well, you know, and then I spoke, you know, I saw her bring out again, and it says something, uh, Fifty Shades, yeah. Never. So I went that. online. And I said, "What is you know? <laughs> <laughs> why are they acting like that?" <laughs> and I realized yeah, you were surprised, yeah. Mm. But the, then it's the, with consent, right? The point is, yeah, right, yeah. If a woman consents to being hit in a sexual context, on liberalism, it's seen as okay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. She gave consent. It's her choice. Okay, so uh, so if, if if things can go to that level mm -hmm. where you're willing to get because that's a that's a level of control. To, sorry to say, yeah. manipulation. The man's got a big whip and whipping the woman. She's saying, "You whip me more," and it's more whip, 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 whip. How many whips? That's like lashing someone. That's that's <laughs> yeah. think about. It. They they attack Islam. No, yeah, for lashing on the basis of what? Mm. On lashes and these things. Hudud, yeah. And by the way, the, the lashes in Islam, classically spoken, were like, you know, the man, the, she, the woman would still be wearing the clothes and it's, it's very light and she can't raise the, whatever. And, but we're talking about some guy that can put his hand like that. This is what I'm thinking. Is this correct? Am I right? In Amsterdam, is that all right? No, if yeah. I go to this uh, red light district. <laughs> I, I in Amsterdam, no you can do everything. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, you can yeah. say, use the whip. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? So... Let's go and ask people on the street. No, right? no, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> a social experiment. Yeah, no, just... well, Ali Dawa should be here doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine Ali Dawa coming in. <laughs> so I want to ask you a question, guys. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. <laughs> you know, if your husband said, <laughs> have a whip, <laughs> would you do it? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Is it? Is it is it moral though? <laughs> Don't tell him why it's coming. Just say violent. Yeah, do you get what I'm saying? So it's conceivable in liberalism that this kind of assault can take place with women's yeah. consent and permission. But it's not conceivable that a woman can say to her husband, look, make a decision where we go here or there. Mm. Double standards. What kind of nonsense is that? Yeah. <laughs> think, about, think about that, seriously. Well, like, so a woman can be assaulted legally, right? Yeah. With her consent, but she can't be told what to do. Mm. With consent, yeah. It's, embar it's embarrassing. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, I would say. Yeah. I saw, by the way, that um, they did a research on uh, women hitting men. Yeah, okay. And uh, the women that hit, hit men most mm. were in Egypt. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So now I understand What's why you don't want to go back culture? here. Well, I think just... men, no, no, we've got a very bad culture in Egypt. Of, well, like, it's one of the worst cultures. And it comes to, I have to be honest here, like, this is called the Harush Jinsi, like uh, where a woman gets molested, sexually molested in public. Uh, what the hell is going on here? I, I was shocked to find that that was going on in Egypt. These desperados, like I was in, a, in a, I was eating food in the mall, yeah, in Egypt. It's called San Stefano Mall. I was eating a pizza with my uncle. And all, I, all I hear is like a woman screaming. I was like, "What's going on?" And she was like, there's "Some she's she's going through some molestation or something like that." I mean, it's what was heavy it? stuff. What, what, yeah, what's man. going on here, man? Just broad daylight. It's crazy. No, we have to be like we have to be fair when we talk about these issues and say that yeah, there might be things going, but. 
there is abuses going on. Gotcha. You know? But not to delve into that. But mm. the 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 have you ever felt the sentiment of I just want to leave, man? I'm sick of this. Yeah, but where, yeah, think, rise of yeah, far right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do like you deal with that? I feel like that all the time. But the, where do I leave to? This is the problem. Yeah. You know. Mm. Uh, you know, li life is a fight. You know, you have to just you have to put up with it. You have to learn to fight, man. You know, you're gonna you're gonna fight. You're gonna fight mentally, intellectually, and sometimes even physically. You know. They also had that is in the Facebook group. People like asking who wants to return to the country of their grandparents, for example. Yeah. And some people said, yeah, I want to go back to Turkey, for example. And guys I know, they're 23, they're born and raised here. I'm saying, listen, you underestimate how Dutch you are. Hmm. Going to Turkey for four weeks is fun, but living there, the social culture, yeah, yeah, yeah. the way yeah. there's still um, corruption and stuff. It's, yeah. Yeah. I think that living in the Netherlands, for example, is a big gift that we have. Yeah. 100%, bro. And that's the thing. I, I don't associate, I, I had this conversation with myself a few times, as I do uh, sometimes talk to myself. And, um, <laughs> and really, I, I do identify not with the whole of the United Kingdom, because I haven't been to all the parts of the United Kingdom. I don't identify with all the cultures in the United Kingdom, but of London culture in particular, and cosmopolitan culture in particular. Like, you guys might not be able to live in, in the Netherlands in certain areas, but, and me the same, I couldn't live in the UK in certain areas, but in somewhere like London and stuff like that, You know, if there's going to be a home, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to be somewhere like that because we've lived there for a Yes, Qadi had a really interesting answer to this question. He was asked basically, um, so I want to preserve my Islamic identity, etc., etc. Should I make hijra? Should I go to another country or not? And he said, the fact that you are thinking about this means we need you. Stay those here. who are most concerned with migrating for the sake of Islam should stay. And yeah. those who are engulfed in the fitna of the societies, you better leave. <laughs> Because That's we don't need said. you. Yeah. yeah, we don't he need said, you. He said, if you are aware yeah. of the fact that this society can be tempting for you, but you're trying to preserve your Islamic identity, we need you, he said. Yeah. Really well, all of that stuff is, is very well and good. But I mean, if we're talking about a fiqhi ruling, uh, that's not my area, as you know. Uh, talk about hijrah. Sure, sure. A fiqhi ruling. No, we don't need it to was a, it, was a, it wasn't a ruling. But it was just on a, on a but, mindset. But I get the point level. you're making. Yeah. And I, do, I would add to that that um, every case is different. With someone coming from some parts of Somalia, for example, or Afghanistan, or Yemen, or Syria, they have nowhere to go back to. If you go back to those areas, you have a high chance of death, to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm not saying all Somalia is like that. I'm not saying all Yemen is like that. But there are parts of Somalia and parts of Yemen, which if you go back to that area where your parents were from, that there's a high chance of death. So, I mean, sure. are they to be compared with someone who's coming from, I don't know, Dubai or something, they live in the UAE all their lives and they have, you know, the same kind of luxuries. And if they come to the UK, maybe they're tempted. And yeah. So every case is different and I'm not going to give it. I want to make an interesting uh, bridge, Mohammed. You yep. spoke about life being a fight and yeah. um, uh, you're doing combat sports, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You started um, boxing yes. and then you went into wrestling and now yeah. you're doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Um, Sinan is a kickboxer too. I've no, been doing Brazilian boxer. 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 Sorry, oh, right, boxer. Kickboxing. I've been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a few months. Yeah, you guys are dangerous What? here in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> we have to, we got here to build this. <laughs> <laughs> we need to stay <laughs> with no, no one's dealing with it. <laughs> no. Who's dealing with it? No, but honestly, like getting into <laughs> no, combat. Not physically, by the way. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but getting into combat sports uh, was also part of being able to defend yourself when you get to that. How do you feel that um, doing martial arts, combat sports, has helped you grow as a person? It's very important, in my opinion, uh, because, do you know, for me, like, ther it's therapeutic, right? It's, um, because what is therapy? I, I, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I've done a psychology A-level, right? But a I'm lot not of A-levels. Huh? A lot of A-levels. Yeah, yeah, I've done <laughs> lots of A-levels. Um, and I did a bit of it in degree, like, you know, just some modules or whatever. But yeah. one thing I would say is that What is, what is therapy? What is therapeutic? Like a lot of people would think therapeutic, it would have this kind of conception of laying by the sea in the sun, mm. you know, or going doing into, nothing, doing nothing. Yeah. But I don't think that's therapeutic. I think that's, it might give your body a rest, but it doesn't necessarily give your mind a rest. Mm. And I think the best distraction to distraction is distraction itself. Right. And I know that might sound a bit like circular, right? But I, I don't think it is circular because it's different distractions we're talking about. So if I want to distract myself from day-to-day um, -day issues the, the things yeah. i'm thinking about all the time i try and find distraction in something which i will be forced to think about something else in doing so i'm i don't want to think about let's say for example my brain has been fried from thinking about you know liberalism or something and when you're on the mat almost getting choked you're not yeah, thinking about you're not thinking about that you just want to survive and so, some oh, guys I gotta finish my study <laughs> yeah yeah so, just want to survive some guy yeah. want to take you down this and that you're going to sprawl you all you're thinking about how to survive the round or whatever it, you know Or even when you're thinking about the techniques, you're, you're, you're thinking about something else. 
Yeah. So for me, that's a, it's a great therapy. And it's also physical. Like, you know, you feel like you've done something at the end of it. It's, it's better than just going for a run or something like that. Which, by the way, for me, is not a good idea because quite heavy guy and it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't not good for my knees. Yeah, so I saw one of the videos you did where you had the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competition and you had a conversation with another guy who did yeah, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things I really noticed uh, doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is it teaches you to just face with challenges. Like, you need to face it head on. If you're going to roll with someone, you're going to spar with someone, there's no way to escape it. So you just need to face it. And like you really interesting, interestingly said, it's a metaphor for life, right? Like you get hit on a day-to-day -day basis with all kinds of challenges. And um, it basically forces you to just tackle it head on and just, you know what I mean? Just, just try to navigate it in the best way that you can. Absolutely. I, I remember when I was doing boxing, you know, when I was younger and I, I, had, I was fighting this guy who was who was much older than me uh and he hit me one time <laughs> and i had this guy my trainer he, he said he said if you get hit like that again you know come back to this uh you were dodging this club again yeah <laughs> but he was a heavyweight like he was proper big and we were heavyweights at that time mm -hmm. and what i realized was i was getting beaten by this northwest champ whoever he was yeah and my head was snapping back and i was uh, i was thinking that this is having an effect on my brain you know like Boxing, the thing, the problem with boxing is that for someone who's interested in developing themselves intellectually, it actually, there is a lot of studies that show that it does have an effect on your brain. And if you're trying to develop yourself, if you go through heavy sparring every week, which is what we had to do, and running and sparring and hitting your head, this and that, it's not conducive for that. So I just, it was, for that reason, and for also the reason that, you know, the hadith of Rasulullah you so know, about hitting in the head and stuff, which I thought was amazing you know because it linked with that reality i decided to kind of move into freestyle wrestling and uh, jiu-jitsu not not completely disregarding that striking element which i still do striking classes i still do things like that but i'm not as um, focused on it i would say yeah. right now yeah. so. and i feel like the discussion about doing combat sports doing martial arts is not uh, something we find really a lot in the muslim community so we often need to go to people who are not muslim and to listen to these conversations, right? You turn to a Joe Rogan because they talk about oh, yeah. martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, et cetera. So what would you advise Muslims to do as a combat sport, right? So people who want to defend themselves? Yeah, I think Jiu Jitsu, man. Uh, jiu Jitsu with, with a bit of strike, light, light striking, knowing what to do with the striking and knowing what to do with um, wrestling. Wrestling or Jiu Jitsu, if, if it's a big person, if the person's over, like if it's a man, if it's a boy that's probably gonna grow up to be a like, then wrestling is very good. If you're thinking about protecting yourself about, you know, if for everyone though, jujitsu is great, even for a woman, uh, even for a woman against a man, I would say, because you can, it's very conceivable. Yeah, and for people who don't know what Brazilian you know, Jiu Jitsu is, yeah. it's grappling on the ground, right? Yeah, a Using woman can techniques beat a man quite seven. easily if she knows the techniques, even if he's bigger than her. I've seen some women like they. You shouldn't be watching that, bro. <laughs> 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 Stop, bro. You <laughs> I've no, seen no, no, but really. No, like, I get what you mean. Crazy, no, yeah. It's 100% conceivable. 100%. She knows the techniques. If you know, she, he tries to pick her up and he, she just does a guillotine on him, she can, she can kill him. You know, she. So I don't I teach this to the women in Egypt. This uh, this, <laughs> this is gonna go wrong. <laughs> I'm not gonna no, no, no. Mm. Yeah, but Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. For, yeah, yeah, for for smaller people, for women, for whatever, they they will give them it will give them an advantage over those people, and for everyone, I would say generally, I'm a big guy. I like to do it myself. Yeah. So. I really didn't like. I did it once, but this guy's sweat was in my <laughs> face. Yeah, you know, I didn't like to, it. You have to, you have to get used to it. I prefer boxing. You know, he's not in my face like yeah, that. He's not <laughs> rolling over my head and stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's always like you know, you get hit, you get black eyes, this and that, broken nose. It's, it's problematic if you want to go and do lecture. Imagine you get lecture and you're black eye, <laughs> nose, this and that. It's not good. We we are, we are, we're also curious. Yeah, I just have a few questions. <laughs> So obviously, like Amsterdam is known for the red light district and stuff like that. Can you tell us what this thing is? The red light district. <laughs> you know, because I'm the convert. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's okay, um, convert. It's good you said that, right? Huh? So you know, you had a non-Muslim life before. I had till my twenties. So 20s. you must have. I mean, it was. It's not haram to you know. Because you need to tell us what's going on. But. Well, you have this uh, this section in Amsterdam and it's actually quite uh, located in the city center. You can take a wrong alley and you were there. And you were well, like- for some people it's the right alley. 
<laughs> they act like it's wrong. Adam. You can. Uh, it's literally like Brother, you're shopping. You're, you're, uh, now you're doing advertisement for it. <laughs> no, it's 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 astaghfirullah. Yeah, it's so bad. You were like shopping women. There's like these windows, and there are girls behind it. They're barely dressed, and they hint at you like come and you can have intercourse with them if you want Street. and it's legal and it's like it's literally like you're walking <clears throat> past a shoe store or something you can just say that one i want this i want really man unbelievable so going back to our discussion on like liberalism and stuff like that i mean isn't this kind of like the worst kind of commodification like i've, I've never heard anything like this in my life I'm, I'm actually shocked here. Is this part of, are people acquiescing to this in culture are they okay with this yeah they see it as something liberal and you also hear the argument that it's good that we provide this because else men are going to search for fulfilling ways. their needs in other ways. So this is an healthy alternative. Like rape, what about polygamy, right? brother? Well, I mean, what, <laughs> do mm. you know what I'm trying to say? Mm. What about some uh, institutional? Because the thing is, I've got some questions for prostitutes. I actually do. I would like to have a conversation with one. You can. You want to do another podcast? But uh, she has to, <laughs> to <laughs> we can have we take the equipment with us. <laughs> no, because I think there's deep down in their mind, like there's... There must be, first and foremost, I've, I've got some serious questions, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not saying this to be facetious. Honestly, I just want to know more about this because I'm actually ignorant of what's going on in there. Yeah. Um, say, for example, you've got a woman that she says, come in, yeah? The man comes in and she closed the window. Or maybe she opens, I don't know. <laughs> she closed the window. <laughs> she closes the curtain. Yeah. The, the curtain, sorry, yeah? What goes on behind the scenes? Is that, is it just a private matter now? Yeah. You see, the rationale behind this is they say, if we do not provide it legally, it will be done illegally. And that is even more dangerous. Yeah. That is so why they legalize no, no, but, everything in this yeah, country. I appreciate, yeah. I appreciate that. But you could, in essence, you're legalizing exploitation then. Because what you're doing is, I'm not saying this to you, obviously, but you know, yeah. to you, to them. What they're doing is they're putting a woman in grave danger here. Yeah. Because it only takes a few seconds for certain things to happen <laughs> when a woman is in such a vulnerable position. Would they say it's her own choice? She chose for the job. And the fun thing is, it's known that most of these girls are forced into it. They're pro most of them not even Dutch. They are taken really? from Eastern European really, countries. Yeah. yeah, it's human trafficking and they know it, but. So why don't they do anything about it if they know this? Because they say, if we do it, it will be illegal and it will also be done and they deserve money by it. Somebody, okay, so, so what we need to do guys, seriously is, uh, this is my suggestion is I think that we have to do Operation Rescue, right? <laughs> That's a good name. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I recommend here, as honestly, as an open initiative for any Muslim or any, even not even a non-Muslim organization, is to open up like a non-government uh, thing, yeah? Where these particular prostitutes, which a lot of them have been forced into doing what they're doing, they can come forward, yeah? to tell their stories and how, you know, how they've been coerced to do it in a safe space, being anonymous and these things so that people can see, because what we need is we need a movement of, we need a counter movement basically. We need the movement to see, people need to see the exploitation that these people are suffering. Because what right now what's happening is this suffering in silence, yeah? And the culture is stronger than these women's voices, frankly. And I think there's even a feministic case to be made for this, yeah? Not only a feministic case to be made for it, but you can say every kind of case that can be made against this. Um, so we need to, I think there should be an initiative where these women can find a safe space to come forward and say, okay, this is my story. I've come from Eastern Europe. You know, I've been, I've been trafficked here. I've, I've done this, I'm doing it against my will. If there's enough of those women that do that, I think that could create a big change here in uh, Dutch culture. That's interesting. Do we have some time? Yeah. yeah. So you're now saying an initiative for the Muslim community and I actually wanted to ask you, like we're struggling with certain um, challenges as a Muslim in the West. Mm. What do you think the key essential institutional forms that are still missing nowadays that Muslims need to create for themselves in the future to be, for example, the Jewish community is really set in in Dutch culture. Like they wanted to ban um, religious slaughter mm -hmm. because of the Jewish community, that law didn't come true. But as a Muslim community, we lack institutionalism. Like we are not on that level yet. So what are the areas Muslims need to specialize themselves in, in the short future? The organization that I, you know, I co-founded with a few of my friends, Salam. Uh, yeah, Salam, we specialize in three areas, mm. which is research, training, and media. Yeah. yeah, and we think that those three areas are key. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have done the organization and made it those three things unless we thought that they were foundational. 
So research, you need to research not only social issues, but you need to mix it in with as many religious themes or non-religious themes or social themes, political themes as possible. So that's the research element. Publications need to be made, books need to be written, uh, you know, articles need to be written with a specific Islamic focus. So we need to have a brain because behind the operation, because if you don't have um, a publication sector, what's going to happen is, frankly, I believe it's going to be shallow arguments being made. Uh, counter arguments can easily be made. So the publications and the research is the spine of all operation. And then research in uh, theological points and bring those to the forefront to counter yes. Uh, counter absolutely uh, argument the narrative the dominant narrative absolutely so yeah. we need a, a, a robust interdisciplinary approach okay where we look at people from different subject specific specialisms they need to interact with one another they need to come together and they need to work with each other and they need to show each other they need to teach each other frankly they need to spend time with one another and there needs to be programs for that and that's what we're doing in salam so we've got people for example theologians that are like Sheikh Mohammed Al Thamani, the CEO. Yeah, he, for example, his his area is fiqh yeah. and also hadith, right? Yeah. So he he's giving us that information that you know he's going into the books in ways we can't go into the books. But at the same time, now we're giving him the information on feminism and liberalism and so, so on, and we're mixing it tank. together. So it's, it works like a think tank, yeah. right? But it's interdisciplinary. Yeah. So a think tank sometimes usually is focused on one or two course yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah. This is, we're really thinking, okay, let's bring the scientist in, let's bring the, you know, the political philosopher in, let's bring, you know, whoever it is we need for these issues to be solved in, and let's bring them together and let's create publications and let's have the arguments there. So right? that's research? So that's research. Training, do? training, now you need to train people on those arguments, okay, which is hopefully we can do that. Um, and we've been doing that, right? So we go around and we try and get people from different, countries and we train them on the arguments on a basic level. Now they don't have to have the deep research there or deep understanding, but so long as they can defend themselves and training should be specific to groups, but also to our family members as well. So we need to train our family members. Why? Because if they, once again, going back to my life story, you know, when our children go to school and the science teacher is telling them about the big bang theory, you know, then they can say what happened before the big bang, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, explain to me what happened. How did the Big Bang come into existence? How can you explain the emergence of the Big Bang? Smart six-year-old kids. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. Honestly, all they need is one question, and it will put, it will throw the cat in with the pigeons, right? It will put the spanner in the woodworks. It will, it will disturb their, it will destabilize their way of thinking completely. One question that you know, I remember one time, Allah, I was working in a school in South London, and um, the woman was trying to use. There was a particular teacher. She was an RE teacher and she was trying to use evolution. I was working now, right? Not a student. And she was trying to use evolution as a way of undermining God's existence, right? She's making the argument. So I spoke to one of the kids who came out of the of that class, year nine classroom, which means he was about 14 years old. And he was, he was telling me about the argument. I said to him, ask her one question, yeah? And keep asking her the same question, which is how does evolution undermine the existence of God? So he kept asking her that question until she gave up. <laughs> she couldn't answer it. It's just one question. Yeah. But it was, it was a 14 year old asking that question to the woman. And she just felt, you know what? He's got a point. I know where he's coming from. I know the argument. He knows the argument. I can't do my propaganda. And for him, it's more important to see that she cannot answer, right? He doesn't yeah. need the answer. Yeah, he just yeah. has to see she Absolutely. doesn't have all the right. answers. So training is, is specific to certain groups that can carry the message and do, but also to our families as well. So we said one is research, is research training. training and media. Yeah. Now media is a very important thing, but you can't have media with us. You can't have people to speak to if you don't have anything to say, right? And what's your vision for good media? Because there are all, all kinds of media, right? You have YouTube videos, you have television. Uh, I think what you guys are doing is good. I mm -hmm. think social media is really, it's a cheap and effective way of getting to as many people as possible. We have found, right? And it's competitive to the extent whereby it can outstrip the numbers you would get on satellite and, uh, TV. Traditional media. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So social media is, I think, the bypass. And I think it actually could be the ticket for us to be able to put forward ideas that we would never have dreamt of being able to put forward 20 years ago, let alone 50 or 100 years ago. Because we have bigger media. reach. Yeah, it, it, it just, you know, the, all we need to do is know how to deal with social media now. Now, if you can make a station or radio station or a television station, in the UK it's very expensive. We know the numbers. Sky Digital, you know, which is one of our main things, it's about a million pounds to have a license.
a million sterling pounds, which is a lot of money, and run, uh, startup costs, and uh, uh, you know, and frankly, I'll be totally honest with you, some of those channels on on Sky, you know, on social media, we're doing better numbers than they are. Yeah. And because also on demand, right? Yeah, no, you it's can look it up when you want. Yeah, we, we want to do numbers so we can get to as many people as possible to change as many minds as possible yeah. in order to, to reach, to put Islam in every home. That's all it is. We're not doing it for fame. We don't give a damn. Anyone who comes forward with an argument for God's existence, for Islam, for the Prophet Muhammad and being a prophet, or to so help our issues, our social issues, is what we need. Right? And what do you think should be the main subjects discussed when creating this media content? What I think the focus be on? there should definitely be a focus on Tawheed, mm -hmm. 100%. There has to be a focus on La ilaha illallah, in the sense that, but La ilaha, as Zaki and I used to say, you know, the atheists, they, you know, already got them. He's half already half a Muslim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we've got La ilaha, and he goes, it's my job to say, illallah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So same thing, because, you know, he's right. We need to, well, la ilaha here means let's destroy your idol of liberalism or feminism of, uh, of, of any of the other ideologies which you think are like even scientism, right? Wherever it may be, let's first work on destroying that idol, like the Quran did, you know, with the, literally with the idols of the physical idols of the people. And then we can establish illallah. But we need to have tawhid, there's a, there's a, the, you, you're not going to have a successful thing if you don't have your religious narrative imprinted you know, in that narrative. So number one is Tawheed. Number two after that is, you know, those deconstructionist type arguments against those things we've mentioned. And number three, obviously, a case for Muslims should be made. What do you mean by that? So a case, a social case for Muslims, where we, where we outline the inconsistencies of non-Muslims dealing with certain things like, for example, um, political matters, where, whether it's uh, the burqa ban or uh, creating ban awareness or hijab for far-right propaganda, responding to far-right, all of those things are important. Fighting the accusations. Yeah. yeah, we need to do that as well. So those three things, are, if, if you ask me what are the most important things for Muslims in the West that will change narratives particularly is those three things, which is what we, we hopefully want to specialize in we're still quite a, a young organization, but if you wanted to summarize it in three things, it's research, it's training and media. media. Yeah. Those are the three things, inshallah. I uh, heard you say that what has helped you gain emotional stability and a uh, conscious stream of thought yeah. is the Quran, yes. the Quran and your prayers. Somebody who doesn't know the Quran and like when you speak from your heart, what's the importance of the Quran and how has it uh, helped you in your emotional well-being. The Quran gives purpose, right? You know, and it gives guidance. And these are two things we need. Um, because when you're in the jungle of life and you don't have a map or a compass, mm. you feel like you are lost. Bro, this is really interesting that you say this. Yesterday I was reading uh, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People yeah. again, the introduction, and you spoke about having paradigms. Yeah. And your paradigm is the way you view the world, the way you interpret the world. And your paradigm is basically your map. Yes. So if you um, have the right map, you'll get to where you want to go to. And if you go to London and you have the map of Detroit, mm -hmm. you get lost. You get lost. And so the Quran changes this, this map, this paradigm. Absolutely. So it's interesting that you say. Yeah, that that's, how, that's how I would put it to them. I'll say to them, this is a, a communication from the all-knowing, all-wise um, creator of the universe. And he's telling us what's best for us. So if you want to, if you want to be successful, follow it. If you don't, if you don't follow it, you're not going to be successful. And how did you work on creating a connection with the Quran? What's your advice on students who are listening to develop a real connection with the Quran? There have to be there has to be a daily portion. You um, look, life is like a conveyor belt. You know, you are what you consume. Yeah, there's 168 hours in a week. There's 24 hours in a day, and you are made up of days. Like Hassan al Basri said, we are days, and every day we lose a part of ourselves. So in other words, we are composed of that which we do on a daily basis. So we have to look, and I've done this myself. I actually spent time doing this. I spent time looking at, um, on an average day, how long I spend doing everything from going to the toilet to eating food and whatever. And I looked at it in proportional terms and I wanted to see the minutes and hours I spend doing everything. And as a pie chart kind of figure, how long I spend doing X, Y, Z. And you'll be surprised at how much free time you actually have in a week. You'll be very surprised. If you eat 168 hours, let's, for the sake of argument, say you sleep for 50 hours a week, which is seven hours a day. 
49 hours, whatever, but you know, 50 to round up, right? So if you still, they used to go 118 hours, say you go to work, come back, whatever, keep the, keep minusing it. I'm promising you, you're gonna have at least 70 hours left, at least, right? And the question is, what do you do with the, those 70 hours? I, I did this experiment in, in some community centers uh, where I used to kind of tutor and, and help people and, and all those things. And um, I did this experiment with some people, some Muslims, and asked them to do this thing where literally they're just thinking about and estimating how long they've been doing everything. And it turned out that those people who are Muslims that have not yet started to practice, they spend more time in the toilet than they do you know, praying, for example, when you outline things like that to them, so you spend more time doing this. It's than confronting, that. right? It is a very confronting reality, right? It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. So I spend more time um, watching this on YouTube or going on Facebook. I mean, now we have apps to show us how long we spend doing things, right? And I think they're, they're effective apps. I think do as much as possible to know what you are doing. Take yourself outside of yourself and ask yourself, what are you doing with your life, right? It doesn't get, get measured, measured, doesn't get managed. Right, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So then you ask yourself, what am I consuming? So if what you're consuming on a daily basis is garbage, then obviously the out product is, you know, the end product is going to be also garbage, right? So what we have to do is we have to keep implementing things in our lives, which are pure, which are clear. And the Quran is that, right? It's a shifa. It's something which is a healing. And it's, it's been described in the Quran in the same way as honey was described. Because it's sweet. It's, um, it has a medicinal effect, right? It has a spiritual effect. You know, it looks good. You know, it feels good, you know. And, and also, it's nourishing. So it gives you that replenishment. Like, just like honey gives you a repl replenishment, it gives you rejuvenation. It gives you that, um, that sense of sweetness. All of that is embodied in the Quranic <coughs> message because you're going to have that medicinal effect, that spiritual effect, that healing effect, but you also have that nourishing effect, you know? And so it, you are what you eat and you are what you do and you are what you consume. So if you want to be a healed person, a guided person, you know, a person who's, who has a spiritual, you know, firmness in their life, then the Quran is the only way to go. The prayers must be the spiritual spine of your daily routine. And the Quran must be the necessary complement to that spiritual spine. And then you can start developing from there. But if that, those two things are not in place and not firmly in place, then it makes no sense to add anything else to your schedule so far. Some time in doing Quran a day, even if it's 15 minutes or 10 minutes, Like if you, even if you do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just do it consistently. Like the Prophet said, the best things are those which are yeah, done consistently. Consistent. Yeah, قل, even if it is small, and you know, so five, 10 minutes, no problem. But you just do it. And you'll find, you'll see that, you know, if, you, if you're someone who's used to eating junk food every day, you know, if you're used to eating junk food every day and you start eating healthy food, you might not like the, your body might not be responsible, uh, responsive to it in the first instance. Has to get used to it. But you need, to, you need to allow yourself some time to get used to it. If you're someone who drinks Coca-Cola every single day and then you start drinking water, you're, you might think this is not the, you know, I'm not used to this. I'm not being stimulated in the way I'm used to, right? But what's happening to your body? You're being purified from within. So in the initial phase, period, you might feel as you're doing this with the Quran and so on, that, you know, I'm working hard to get this, right? But you have to do that. And now we're going into Ramadan as well. It's a perfect opportunity for people to do this. Just spiritually detox yourself and clean up yourself, inshallah. And I'll try and take my own advice. But yeah, that, that is the most important thing. And you won't be effective in, in either guidance or guiding people unless you have the Quran as a bedrock of your um, daily routine. So we're wondering, like extreme right is in the uprising in, in, Western, uh, in the Western world. And I've thought long about, okay, what can be the, the main causes? And I've got my own theory, yeah, I didn't test it. And I think that it has been a while since the Second World War. And people tend to forget that peace in Europe is not the rule, is an exception. Before the Second World War, Europe was always in a war. That was the norm. Right now, we have a period of 80 years of peace. And um, the generations after the Second World War, they were very left, you could say. They didn't want anything to do with right. And now we have a generation from whom the second world was nothing more than just something they read in a history book. 
And let's be honest, um, extreme right has an alert to it. Like it gives people purpose. It give them, uh, gives them a sentiment of us being against the other. So what do you think one of the causes can be for this extreme right? I think you've very well summarized some of the main points there. Um, and I think you're totally correct in saying that, you know, the European powers were against each other, you know, throughout World War One, World War Two, before that even, you know, the, the colonial powers, the empires were fighting each other. That was the reason for World War One. Real politic, Bismarck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's, they decided to, okay, put our guns down and not fight each other, but unite with one another. And, you know, let's, uh, let's maybe deal with, obviously you had the Cold War, which shouldn't be kind of forgotten as well. But after the Cold War, now it's a matter of the United States of America establishing its allies yeah. and doing to the world uh, what it wants to do. And I think that you're absolutely right to say that human beings have a tendency to tribalism, yeah. you know? And tribalism can be fixed on the, um, on the basis of nation and it can be fixed on the basis of color. And a lot of the sentiments we see from the far right, uh, even if it's implicitly, um, for example, racial, it is there. The, the racial element is necessarily there as well, but it's definitely nationalistic. So I think that the motivating factor there is like you said, a sense of unity, a sense of feeling like us versus them, that you are achieving something you're not achieving. Yeah. And the Quran says, You know, they like to be praised for what they don't do. Human beings sometimes like to be praised for what they don't do. Um, when you watch, for example, World Cup uh, football, why do people cheer for, you know, for example, their countries and they're not involved in that themselves? It's because they like to be, they like to be praising something which they don't do. They feel a sense of accomplishment. You might see someone who's, you know, who we comes... Won. Yeah, yeah. We, won. we won, right? Yeah, yeah. Who is who are you? You didn't get involved in this <laughs> process. You didn't do anything, yeah. Right, so they want to feel success through the proxy of some other people, right? And um, and the only way they feel the way they need to do that is to get involved in conflict and to, to win the conflict. So they need a bad guy. And obviously right now the bad guy is becoming the Muslim. But also then a critical question, like do you think there is a blame in our own community for the rise of extreme right? Because if you look at how some of our community members react to, for example, something happens in Palestine or something. And then you see how we react in the streets in the West. We attack a police officer, for example, who has nothing to do with it. So would you say that it has also something to do with the way we react on criticism or things that happen in the Middle East, for example? The thing is, the Muslim, Muslims are one, one quarter of the world's population. Yeah. If, if we're waiting for the time where one quarter of the world's population is going to act in a completely non-criminal way, yeah then such a time is not going to come, yeah. all right? So I, I feel like that is the argument of the far right, that look how you guys react. Who are we guys? We are one quarter of the world's population. We're two billion individuals. And you're going to find someone bad if you're going to yeah, search for Yeah, we're it. not the Jewish community because the Jewish community is, is, you know, 20 million people or something like that. They're not even 1% of the Muslims. We can't make comparisons on a worldwide level between those two communities, for example. And even then, if you did want to make comparisons, look what's going on in Israel and so on, that's a different discussion. But the point is, what I was going to say was that we shouldn't be blaming ourselves too much. I think that's what they want us to do. But we should be introspective and we should remind people, especially from these kind of pulpits, if you like, and places of uh, influence, we should remind people that you know, there is a responsible way of responding to things. And there's a possible, there's a good way of responsible to things. There's an effective way of responding. And what is that exactly? So what, what should yeah. we do as a Muslim community? It depends. It really does depend on the situation. I can't give you a one size fits all policy. It depends on what's happened, you know? And um, that, so the, the response depends on, and it, once again, it requires that multidisciplinary research and then training and then that, you know, media and all that kind of thing. So I don't think there's one answer. But I think so long as we're making an effort in that direction to make a counter argument or to make an argument, you know, then we can ensure our protection in the future. But if we're not even making arguments, then they're going to make the arguments on our behalf. There's something you said yesterday, right? Yeah. The gay community back then and the black community in the USA back then, mm. they were screaming a lot louder than we are doing right now. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, but to be fair, I mean, the, the, the black community in particular, they went through a lot more than we went through, yeah? 
as a community, they remember that you had slavery and things like that. And so is you, you could argue that, okay, well, blacks and Muslims are not to be separated. You can also argue that, well, we had colonialism, which is a kind of slavery in some cases as well. But it, we are wait, we don't need to wait to be enslaved, right? Because that could happen. Now, we, we might think we're free now, but all it requires is two or three election results by way of right-wing parties and stuff like that. And we can start seeing paradigm shifts in the way politics operates in this country, which might not affect us directly, but will certainly affect our grandchildren. So we need to start speaking now, because if we don't, I think that there is a danger, once again, that these changes are going to start being made. So that's a really interesting point. Also yesterday, you got a question about being introspective and you basically said like, first make sure that we can defend our rights and then be introspective. Then we, uh, it's complimentary. The discussion can happen yeah. at the same time, but we first need to make sure that we are able to defend our rights and are able to, um, yeah, basically ensure our safety. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really interesting point. Malcolm X, by the way, I was watching yeah. recently. Malcolm X, is, he's got a good approach on this in the sense that you know, whenever asked about this, don't think that the black community in America weren't uh, and are continually not, like any other community, engaged in criminal activity. But that doesn't stop them from getting their rights. Because why? Because of a non-compromising attitude. We can, we can talk about the thing, bad things we're doing, you know, but let's talk about the bad things that are being done to us first. I mean, like you know, uh, Norman Finkelstein said, talking about the situation between Gaza and uh, Israel. He says, when a rapist um, is raping, you know, someone, and then the raper, the one who's being raped, you know, spits at the rapist and says, you know, leave me alone or something like that. Then don't ask the rape, the, the rape victim why they're being spat at, you know, when you have the rape going on. Sometimes these things are knee-jerk reactions, but sometimes actually they, they're predicated on a very deep foreign policy grievance that had it happened to them, frankly, they would not be acting in the same way. You know, we, what's happening in the world now, if you look at the catastrophes that are happening in Burma with the Uyghur Muslims in China, in, in three or four different countries in the Middle East, like Yemen and, and Syria and so on, and Libya, we're going through a lot, I mean, to be honest with you. And, uh, and so it's not easily brushed under the cover. And a lot of the reason why that is the case is because of either the active participation of the Western world or the acquiescence of the West. So that, that stuff cannot easily be brushed under the carpet and say, well, you know, we need to be introspective. But look what's going on, you know? Guantanamo Bay in the West and all these things. There's too many things going on for us to just kind of turn a blind eye and say, well, we need to think about ourselves. Right. So we, we also need to be, I think we're, we're, we're being passive now, we're becoming weak. And, and the reason why is because we feel like we need to fit in. We don't want to, we fear ostracization. We fear, you know. We're all be already being criticized. Right. That's not just yeah, racism. Alienation, you know. Yeah. It's a weak approach. Just leave, you know, just leave it, you know, brother. No, let's not, let's not leave it. You know, you'll see when they come knocking on your door whether you leave or not, you know. Yeah. So I, I do think that the approach sometimes can be a bit too passive and a bit too weak. And had the blacks in the, in the 60s once again had that approach, they wouldn't get what they have now. Which brings me to another interesting point. Um, uh, you also had a conversation about uh, using anger during your debates, right? With other people. And you made the self-criticism that you felt that uh, in the beginning, during the debates, you might have been too mild, too soft to the opponents, and that you switched up your style, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the observation that you made in doing that? Because I think a lot of starting people starting um, uh, Muslims, doing debates, et cetera, can fall into the same, uh, the same trap? Yes. What was the observation there? I think this is actually a matter of creed. Um, and I, I know it sounds a little bit uh, maybe unusual, but there are some people you need to be angry about and hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, You know, You know, you will not find the people that believe in Allah and His Messenger, uh, sorry, and the last day, who you had duna man had Allah wa Rasulah. They're showing love to those who show opposition to Allah and His Messenger. Even if they were their fathers and their uh, their brothers and uh, the extended family, the Ashira. Why would you not find that? Because it's not possible, and this is a very important distinction. Yeah, a lot of people ask the question: Why? Why were you like that with David Wood, trying to humiliate him? You know, I had smash him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I had, a, no, I had an objective to humiliate David Wood, and the reason why is because he was man had Allah wa Rasulah. He was a person who 
He was not a he he was not a person who's just a disbeliever. Mm-hmm. A disbeliever, even if they vocalize their disbelief, you don't have any reason to be horrible to them or to pe- speak badly to them. But if they are into the field of gratuitous insult, mockery, and trying to attack you through your sacred items and religion, then I believe those individuals need to be opposed. You know, um, with harshness. I, I don't think it is even Islamically legitimate to be kind with those people. I think it's haram to be kind to those individuals. That's my that's my belief system. If someone has, has is on the record uh, and they have been uh, they've been uh, mocking of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they have been uh, attacking you know Islam and the Muslims, and you're nice to them. That is a, that's haram to be like that in my opinion, because the Quran says لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حد الله ورسوله. So if there's three criteria in here, if the people are not trying to kill you, like Allah says, you know, uh, they don't try and kill you for your religion. And they don't try and kick you out of your homes. And number three, they don't try and uh, oppose Allah and his messenger. Then we can be, if you don't do these three things to me, then we can have a nice conversation and I have no reason to be disrespectful to you. Then you have, then you, the default position is that I'm going to be respectful to you. But if you have said something about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the record, or if you have done something rude or have attacked the Muslims on the record, then expect from me, expect a harshness. Do not expect uh, kindness. And if you, uh, kindness is, you know, وَلَا تُجَادِلُ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هَيَ أَحْسَنْ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ The Quran says, do not do jidal with Ahl Kitab. Do not argue with Ahl Kitab except with that which is better. Mm-hmm. Except for the ones who have done dhulm of them. So in other words, I think it was a mis- It's not a mistake. Some du'at make this mistake. They make the mistake thinking that I have to be kind in all cases. And they do istidlal with the, with the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anhu uh, anha in Bukhari. مَا كَانَ الرِّفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَعْنَا وَمَا نُزِعَ الرِّفْقُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَهُ That Allah, the, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said <laughs> that the rifq, the goodness, wasn't in anything except that it made it beautiful. And it wasn't taken away from anything except that it made it beautiful. Yeah, that's true, as a, that, that we accept that. And we accept also, yeah, we accept also that our responses should be proportionate because in the beginning of the hadith, those Jews said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Assamu alaykum, may death be upon you. Yeah. And she went further, this, this, is that. And he said, look, don't say this. Just say, wa alaykum. Just say, and you as well, you know. Be proportionate. Don't be too much, right? Even if it was someone who's, you know, whatever, like, you know. Um, but at the same time, don't show love to an enemy. That's a big mistake people make. If someone has made an enemy out of you and you show them love, that's ignorance and that's weakness. It's not uh, courteous. It's not... Uh, nice, it's not Islam wouldn't be it's haram. Right it's not like even even right it's actually not halal. It's not halal, it's not good, it's haram. And Allah has uh, harsh words to say about people that do that. And unfortunately we need to make the disclaimer we're not talking about physical attacking them or anything. Oh of course not. Yeah, just yeah. right, right. <laughs> just by discussion. We need to One add the disclaimer. Other yes. question I was <clears throat> kinda of curious about because I see a lot of young Muslims struggling when they have success but they are over humble. They are like, no, Achi, no, I don't want to be mentioned. No, no, it's fine like that. How do you find the right balance between <laughs> taking pride in what you do? Because we have too little uh, young Muslim role models. They're always on the background because they don't want to be on the foreground. Maybe it's not humbleness. Maybe they're using, maybe you perceive it as humbleness, but in, the, in their case, it's cowardice. Because actually a lot of them, no, it's, they're scared. They're scared mm-hmm. to come out. Look, don't think that everyone who doesn't want to take uh, a front position is doing so out of humbleness. Some of them are genuinely scared. Mm-hmm. They're, they're thinking, oh my God, imagine I get humiliated, you know. Yeah. On my <laughs> career. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That's what it is. It's not a matter of, don't think everyone who acts humble is humble. Yeah. You know, someone who's acting, in your mind, you're, you've got a mashallah, a very good opinion of that person. I heard but, a very interesting quote. It said, yeah. uh, fake piety boosts the ego. Yeah. Of, yeah, of yeah. fake humility basically boosts yeah, the ego. Yeah, but a lot of those yeah. guys don't have that anyways. It's just, it's just like, you know, Adnan Rashid, I had a conversation with him one time, yeah? I remember this, it was, he's, he's, mashallah, he's, he's very active, very hard, like tough guy. He's not easy to defeat in an argument. And I was saying, you know, brother Adnan, 
and he convinced me of this. I had the same question to him. I said, you know, brother Adnan, there's a lot of students of knowledge out there. They've got so much knowledge. Yeah, and, but they're not coming out, you know, to do dawah and we need them, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because those guys are not interested enough. They're not motivated enough. You know, sometimes you need someone with less knowledge and more motivation because, the, the, so, because sometimes certain skills can't be developed easily. You might have someone who's alim, but he go out into the, the, the world, you won't be able to, you're not going to be able to establish that rapport with people. So it's not all about knowledge. Knowledge is, a, is the most important component, I'm going to say, but it's not the only one. And a lot of these people, are, they know their own limitations when it comes to communication. And they realize that, you know, I don't have it in me. So they, they don't mind staying in the background because they're afraid of humiliation. They're afraid of humiliation. And, and others, because look, we're in, a, we're, we're in a situation of desperate need now, you know? So we, we, we haven't got the time to play this humility card. If it was about humili uh, humility, you know, then the Sahaba would have been awla min dalik, you know? They would have not come uh, out and done da'wah or you can't use that as an excuse not to do da'wah. But by the way, sorry, one thing is I'm not saying da'wah is there for everyone. I do believe it's for, 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 the, for a part of the community, not for everyone. But if you're qualified and you're looking at people that are unqualified doing the job, it's like someone who is a half of the Quran, which I've seen, by the way, proper half of the Quran. And they say, oh, you and their tajweed is perfect. Yeah. And then some guy in the masjid, he says, uh, I want to lead the prayer. I said, okay, lead the prayer. He can't recite Fatiha. And you've let him le le lead the prayer, brother. And you knew this about this guy. But that's not, that's not humility. That's, that's haram what you've done, actually. Not taking responsibility. Yeah, it's, it's your, 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 you might as well not have, you know, you're, you're not benefiting the community. It's like a doctor. Imagine people are dying and they said, look, you know, hey, I'm not going to come in. <laughs> well, like, it's, it's, what is that? Yeah. You know? So the discussion also that uh, rises with this question. So, um, for example, one time we had a discussion about uh, we need more role models, etc., etc. We need more leaders. What does an effective leader need? And um, uh, one of the brothers, he basically said, should you want to be a leader? Because mm. then you get on the foreground and being on the foreground, it can mess with your intentions and uh, make you not sincere in that journey, right? So how do you find the balance between staying sincere and being on the foreground? You know, there's a beautiful Arabic parable, which is Sayyid uh, al-Qawm Khadimuhum. You know, the leader of the tribe is their servant. So, you know, leadership is not something you should ever want. Yeah? Spot on, yeah. It's something that will come to you if you are worthy of it. You should never say, yeah, I'm going to put my... Yeah, sometimes you might need to put yourself forward as a leader or something, yeah? But I'm not saying that that's not legitimate. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is... You should never go to it. You should never go to that position because why do you want to be a leader anyway? You're going to have enhanced responsibilities. The reason why people want to be a leader, I think it's kind of like the new capitalistic trend. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, have more rights and people are going to tell them what to do. But you have more responsibilities, you know? So I, I feel like being a leader of certain things, it's not desirable. It's not actually desirable to be a leader. It should not be desirable, but it should be that you want to be a, lead, a leader in order to serve. So why not serve in order to serve first? And then we can talk about the second bit. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're not serving in order to serve, then you're being a leader in order to serve doesn't make any sense. Right. But if, you're, if, you're, if you have no intention to be a leader in order to serve, yeah. and you just want to be a leader if for the sake of being a leader, then your intention is the wrong place. And how do you manage being on the foreground and staying sincere? Because I, this is a constant battle, right? Constantly you need to do the, the, the basically the purification of yourself and making sure that your intention in the right, is in the right place. Do you know who helps me the most with that kind of stuff? My critics, you know? They help me, they, they, they take care of that job for me. The people you debate. Yeah, not only the debate, the, the, on the online community. Don't think that you're going to come out and... The YouTube comments. Yeah. Making, you also make your own criticism videos, right? I saw of one. myself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm standing in a, uh, what was it, a pink fest and stuff like that. That was a nice fest now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's talking about that. But um, what I was going to say was, um, yeah, like, you know, everyone is already attacking me on these things. Like, you don't think that, yeah, some Muslims, we're, we're in a, you know, comfortable environment with Muslim events and stuff like that, shaking hands and stuff. But the truth is, you know, we have also the same amount of people that, you like you and like you appreciate what you're doing. You have the same amount, if not more people, actually they hate you. Mm -hmm. And some of them want to kill you, in fact. <laughs> so when it comes to that level, and you're, you're looking and walking in the street and sometimes it actually happens, you know, I actually, I'm not sure, did I tell you about this? You might have heard, some guy was knocking on my window in the car. I said this in the other podcast, did I not? No, I haven't heard this. I was driving a car and I was, I, and some guy started smashing the window. Yeah. 
So I came out and he went straight into boxer stance. <laughs> 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 you know, no seriously. discussion, nothing. Let's so, okay, go. I mean, uh, no problem. So we got into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> so we, did this thing. we got into a fight, and then honestly, the, and then I saw some people taking out their phones and stuff like that when the guy was bleeding, and then, <laughs> then, 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 and then I thought I need to get out of here, so I started driving really fast, you know. Because the police was coming. <laughs> I, <thought laughs> wait, wait, wait. I have one question. Did you say anything to each other? Or was it just silence no, it was from the beginning? Ridiculous. I, I was just defending myself. I came, okay, I came out. I know what's going was, on. He, he started trying to attack me. But, yeah. you know, I realized he was a boxer. Basically, I realized he was a boxer. You know? So they got a boxer to try and beat me up. Yeah. The problem is I've been doing kickboxing for some time now. <laughs> so, so I kicked him. <laughs> and he didn't know how to respond to it. Yeah. So he was like that. And then, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, uh, the thing is, You know, your, your, your life is at danger sometimes. You're thinking like, you saw the video of me being, getting beaten up yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, getting punched in the face and these things. And you, so that stuff puts you in check. You know, it really does put you in check, I think. So that helps me. It's kind of like Allah puts it in place for people like who do da'wah and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, But also from a spiritual perspective, you have to, there's a da'ya that you can make as well, as well like da'ya that you can make for the, uh, there's um, obviously you have to be introspective and think about things. Sometimes you write things down You, you've got to stay connected with the Quran, do things in private, you know, um, don't rely on any of the public deeds. Think that everything that you're doing in public is not going to be uh, rewarded and these kinds of things. But it's always difficult. And I can never say for a fact that, yeah, yeah, 100% on that occasion. I, maybe on one or two occasions where I didn't know, yeah? Because so, there have been one or two occasions where I made videos and I didn't even know I was being filmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the closest thing to... Um, to sincerity that I can probably do. Or if I'm doing uh, da'wah to one person in one place, very secluded, that's very, you know. So things like that is, but even then you don't know. I also have a story about people knocking at your car window. So uh, I drive a Mazda 323 from 1999. And uh, I grew up in the, in the southeast part of Amsterdam, right? They call it the Belmont. And uh, it's basically a rough neighborhood, right? Oh, really? And what, yeah. That's, I you know, that's, that's the image. The, that's the image. That of, the, is the, 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 the buildings, the corporate areas? Uh, they're coming more corporate areas there, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So um, what they have in the Belmont is they have illegal taxis, right? They call it snodders. So it's basically <laughs> immigrants who often don't have uh, any decent papers, who just drive taxi illegally, illegally right? The Uber? Uh, like an uh, unofficial Uber, okay. right? And so one of my friends... He told me, bro, you have a snodder car. It looks like a snodder, right? I was like, nah, 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 just joking, et cetera, et cetera. So one time I was, um, uh, my father lives in the southeast part of Amsterdam and I was there and it was in the night and it was raining, like really dark. And then suddenly she, some woman, she knocks at the, at the window. And I was like, yo, what's this? And I pulled off and I thought, what was this? Was I being attacked or? <laughs> And then I realized, oh, she thought I was a snodder. She, <laughs> she thought, I, oh, I can get in and get a ride with him. You right? could have made some money, though. I could have made <laughs> some money. Have, yeah. I don't see the problem. Yeah. <laughs> just take see, it. I would have taken it. <laughs> What do you need to go to? <laughs> so dude, just, just some yeah. silly no, I've story had about. That. No, I've had that as yeah. well. So I was, I was in the car a few times and then I, I see like a, a blonde woman coming in, sit right next to me. Uh -huh. and, I was, I and I was thinking, what's going on right now? <laughs> she goes, look at me, you Uber? <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not even. <laughs> yeah. I'm fifth wave. Feminism founder. I thought you know because you know. By my comp. I've been going to the gym recently, and so this is the kind of effect I'm having. <laughs> yeah. Wow! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have to open the door and just jump in. You're gonna have a trouble <laughs> later. <laughs> When this is done, you. <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much, Mohammed. Do you have any final khair. words for no, uh, the no. students listening? No, no. no. Khair, it was uh, brilliant. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for all the education as well and um, uh, Dutch culture and stuff like that. I still got a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really want to know too much about the intricacies of what's going on right. in the districts, mm -hmm. but we do have work to, to do there, inshallah. 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 Thank well, you well not that kind of work. <laughs> 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 we, do to, you know. <laughs> we did to find it. Yeah. All right, exactly. So we're going to close off the podcast. Sinan, any final words before we close off? No, I would like to thank you for your presence and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you all for watching, for listening. Um, make sure to follow us on YouTube, on all the channels, uh, on all the audio channels as well. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.